you're good to rock. Cool. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, Eric? Yeah, um, Eric, can you hear me? It's the yes, question because, okay, good. Um, Eric Clark, Alaska State Parks. Um, I kind of deal with the trails across the bay and all that. So that is why I'm here to hear what's what's going to be happening with Alpine Ridge or give any input of where Parks is going to be, how they're going to interact with this. Uh, Carter? Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, Carter Forney, I'm the park ranger over in K-Bay and uh, help Eric with the trails when I can. And uh, super interested to hear uh, all the possibilities that we can have over over there that's a, a great area and lots of use so looking forward to hear what you got and you have some background in trails right you worked up in denali some is that right yeah yeah i worked um oh yeah i worked all over in denali um i helped with uh the cascade project and troublesome actually i've, I've worked with gabe and christine a few times um uh, and the Curry Ridge Trail also. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, uh, Camille? Uh, I'm Camille. I'm on the board. Um, I do work on trails across the bay, but my interest in, is primarily trails on the north side of the bay and, and working with interior trails on Cottonwood Eastland. Um, and do we still have Stan? Yeah, we do. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm uh, Stan Purrington, and I just help out with trails. And I, I did see Yarrow log in briefly and then drop out. So he may be having internet issues. Um, and he's, uh, um, I think he's on the Citizens Advisory Board, I believe, for the State yes, Park. He, he is. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he's also been uh, involved in, in the group um, of GIS geeks and trail geeks that have been kind of contemplating uh different approaches to using using available data to design trails so he may be back we'll see um so let's see i i guess what i'm trying to try to give some context for what i see coming in here and i'll do that and then absolutely uh welcome anyone else to jump in with additional context that you think is needed um uh, so I've been interested uh, in taking advantage of some of the um, the data sources that are available um, uh, potentially for for trail mapping. And so the the most uh, I don't know well known um, kind of high tech trail data is uh, lidar, and that's a lot of what we'll be talking about. There are a few other other technologies out there too, um, and uh, we we actually. Um, so for this area along Alpine Ridge, um, we happen to have a lot of good data. There are two LIDAR data sets, um, which will basically just use one of those. And there's also a really high resolution image that's collected uh, from an airplane using a technique called photogrammetry. Um, uh, so part of my part of my perspective here is just uh, extreme geekiness. I, I um, am interested to see how these uh, technologies might help us out. But I also have spent quite a bit of time on Alpine Ridge Trail working in that area because of landslide hazards. And um, and so that that trail is one I know pretty well and I've come to come to love and hate um, for what it is. And uh, and so um, uh, the idea of that that trail getting some improvement is pretty exciting to me. And um, uh, and so my hope is that this meeting today will be part of a process that will lead to actual trail building, um, uh, possibly benefiting from the sort of digital analysis we're doing. Um, it's one of the big questions I think is is just how much value this can provide. I think at the very least it can help make you know nice illustrations for a, a grant proposal or, or whatever. But my hope is that it will be. Uh, also really helpful in uh, trail layout. And so um, we'll kind of go down that path some. And I also mentioned, so we have both Yarrow and also Betsy Young here now uh, who have both been working with me on this. Um, and so what I, what I kind of, I, I wrote a little bit of an agenda, which maybe I can throw into the Zoom chat, um, uh, which we won't necessarily follow, but it gives us at least a, uh, straw man plan to work with. Um, 
Uh, and so hopefully we'll start, you know, start kind of high level. It might go quite a bit faster than what I what I sketched out here. Um, and uh, and kind of talk about the general situation um, and then gradually zoom in on very uh, specific issues. Uh, Gabe and Christine, I really want to at least spend some time getting very, very detailed, uh, kind of trying to get to the level that would be, you know, if we were standing on the ground, you know, pointing at 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 the surface right in front of us, um, but trying to think at that level with the digital tools. That isn't to say that it's the same as being on the ground, but that just to just to actually raise some of the same questions that I've I've seen come up while while in the field. Uh, but I, I think we should first start with some general context. Um, so that's just some introductory thoughts. I don't know, Gabe, Christine, Eric, Kathy, do any of you have additional context you'd like to add? Not at this point. Yeah, well, context, what I do know, I was looking at your, your little chat thing, photos. Um, I would have to dig to find photos. What I do know about the Alpine Ridge Trail, in a sense, is that it does need work. There's a lot of pitches, as his Hig knows, that, you know, kind of climb and it flattens out climbs. So there's a lot of great terrain to play around with on that. And then one of the bigger issues um, with that whole trail is the climb once you start reaching subalpine or the alder belt and you start climbing up where there are ropes and there is some serious um Grade issues. There's there's a serious erosion. There are safety issues, and stuff like that. Um, and I do see the need um, with the use in the Grunk Valley in the Saddle Trail, especially of adding another spur off into you know to direct people that might want to have a little bit of a longer hike in that high use area that can get them up to views. Be it if they go all the way up to the top to Alpine just to get the view like where the trail stops right now or you know getting up to a flat spot like a like around where the um just before where the alder belt starts is the best way to explain it in my in my way uh that people can get a view of the, like halibut cove lagoon and halibut cove and stuff like that Thanks, Eric. Uh, Gabe and Christine, do you have any any context or questions you want to just throw in right at the start? The one thing I was going to say is I think um, you know we use mapping, digital mapping tools like crazy for all of our work, and most of the time, or they never are quite to the level of sophistication that you're using now um, for this. But I think it's absolutely a, a important and valid. Uh, step in before you hit the ground in the field. So I think it's it's exciting to see that you're um, that you and the team you've been working with are kind of pushing that envelope as far as how much time investment on that level, how much does it save you or or can you, you know, um, yeah, obviously the goal isn't to avoid the step of ground truthing it. Um, as you mentioned at the trails conference, or you'd have to change the name of your organization. <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, I think I mean it's it's cool to see um, what what you're. I'm excited to see what you you've come up with, and um, you know I think it's a, a great a step in the right direction. And um, you know it may be that some projects are there's more applicability of that level of digital detail and um, kind of mapping level detail than others, but. Um, yeah, it's we're both really eager to kind of see what you guys have come up with. Seeing as how almost every project we always start with uh, the step that we call it in our little inner lexicon is map recon or desk recon, which includes all kinds of other stuff like permit sleuthing and talking to partners and finding data that was previously aggregated and all that. Then the map is a big part of that. Um, all we always are wishing for if only we had more detail I mean when we started doing this you know in the private sector maybe 15 years ago it was very rare to even have um, Google map level detail that would load at remote trailheads or that you could get hone in on without it crashing or whatever so 
moving from having started doing this with the really old uh, um usgs like, yeah, like pay, you paper know, map very yeah, large contour uh, lines, contour lines. <laughs> this is a a really big uh jump every year it seems and so moving into some i think really the more the mapping layout step is always really important because basically what it does is it helps you remove um areas that you know are not suitable which Hig, we've talked about this before. It's almost like you're you're building a trail via negative space where you're taking things off the map. And by the time you've removed things because of various negative control points, you have an alignment through a, you know, very large acreage that's actually ground truthable as opposed to, you know, the Mike Shields days where he could take a, a little bit off the map and then have to walk just for weeks. So it's very efficient. And I think especially... For volunteers or for agencies where the money you might have to spend on the upfront is always under pressure it's a great step so yeah we'll go in and i'm sure we'll talk more about the caveats as we go um not just the the main ones to me are not just getting drawn too deeply into thinking what we're seeing is real <laughs> but also sometimes it's easy to you want to balance between saving time that will help you narrow your point of the spear when you're in the field but not getting drawn into design for design sake kind of discussions. Cause sometimes I think you can get, um, I don't know, there's just an amount, there's a, a kind of um, reality check that happens in the field that allows you to do stuff that it's important still to get there as soon as we can. So that's, those are my big backgrounds. The only other technical question I have is, um, could you give a little bit of a sense of what users What's the dominant user profile you see now or in the future for this so we can understand how it relates to locals, visitors, the big tourism plan, connectivity, that kind of stuff. And that might come up with the maps as well, but just kind of an intro. Sure. Yeah, maybe maybe I should go ahead and, and bring up uh, maps so that when we talk about this, we have something to look at here. Um, yeah, I was, uh, so yeah, as far as that question, a good spot to start. Um, so uh, I think everyone's familiar with the saddle trail that goes over to Gruink Lake. Um, uh, so there's, this is readily accessible from Homer. Uh, there are sometimes hundreds of people a day who come and land at this beach and then they hike over this way. Um, and the trail where, I, I think I'm hoping, well, anyway, the way I've organized this, where we'll talk about this portion of the saddle trail as well. So we'll try talk about the entire alignment starting from uh, at sea level going up um, Alpine Ridge and in, into the Alpine up here. Um, and right now, uh, like when I've been around here, I'd walk saddle trail and I'd see groups of 15 people with little kids and, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, very diverse group. Uh, and then I'd go walk up here and in one day I might see, you know, say if there was 200 people on saddle trail, I might see 10 on Alpine Ridge, substantially less, but still a significant number of people. Um, uh, and as Eric was talking about, there are some spots, there's actually one down in here, but the ones that really stand out in most people's minds are some of this climb in this area. There's two sections that have ropes they're like eight foot wide mud stripes uh that you're like going and trying to like get your toe on a little clod of grass in order to like work your way up the slope if it ever rains then it's even worse um which of course never happens in our area um so uh yeah really tough trail and i think that that uh you know that will turn some people around and its reputation you know influences a lot of who goes up there so I think that that you kind of said, well, what do you what do we have now and what do we expect in the future? My guess, and I'd love to hear Eric uh, speak to this as well. But my guess is that if we make a good trail, that the traffic will increase uh, enormously, that using current traffic as a proxy for future traffic would not be good, like that we might you know, we probably will never see quite as much as we'd see on the saddle trail because it's such a short hike to uh, you know, prime destination. Uh, but uh, the I could see it being, you know, a third or a half as much. So, you know, dozens of people per day at the peak of the of the season. Um, and one other one other thing I'll note is that the trail, I think on a lot of mar maps is marked going to this summit, but the trail now goes to here. I've actually dotted in. So this is a map that that's available to the public and I've dotted in this 
curve to the left uh, thing because I'm really worried that it's growing organically quite quickly through the tundra here. And I'm worried it's going to grow up this ridge, which would be uh, a um, yeah perfect spot for, for, you know, wearing a vertical scar up through the tundra that would be extremely hard to um, remediate. So I think any discussion we have of trail building in here uh, needs to be thinking about this upper portion of the trail and I'm going to suggest that we might actually do some of our first work at this end and work back uh, because uh, if we start improving down here and get as far as we get and then send a whole bunch more traffic up here, then this will immediately wear into a less than ideal alignment. Um, Eric, what, what would you add to that? Um, I would add that, you know, as a, an attack plan dealing with the whole um, Alpine Ridge, um, that would probably be a good move is to start higher up and work your way back. Um, I have not been up there in a few years, so I don't know. I have not seen what you're describing in the Alpine area, which that just puts it on the docket for me this summer, once the snow clears to go up and take a look at all this. And maybe we can align with you to do that together, or if not, you know, it just because I'd like to see what what you're seeing and what you're just describing, but dealing with Alpine, yeah, the more as as stuff does get opened up, more use will happen. So it would be it would behoove us to really work at the Alpine and and work back down into the forest. And probably looking at this trail, I bet you Gabe and Christine, you're guessing at how it originally formed. It was people that were like, I'm going to go up the mountain. <laughs> and so they went up the ridge the whole way, right? They went to the first, this actually breaks out just barely into the tundra. I guess I can actually show you a little bit of what this looks like. Um, so there's this little tundra patch. You see the braided trail on top here. Um, and, uh, and so this, I think is actually one of the oldest trails in the park. Uh, um, it's a hunter's trail originally, and it's been around for quite a while. And, um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we've all been on a lot of trails like that and, and seen some of the issues that arise. Um, one of the things I thought it would be useful to touch base on before looking at any specific alignments is general questions about uh, how an ideal reroute of this trail might be built. Um, and so maybe I'll just lay out kind of where my my head went on that, partly based on conversations I had with people, partly just some of my own ideas. Um, I'll just start at the bottom just just to uh, but go through it pretty quickly. So at the bottom, there's, there's, let's see, do I have good imagery here too? Um, yeah, so uh, the current trailhead is a set of very steep stairs here, which I think we're all familiar with. There's this beautiful beach over here. This picture was taken at a really high tide. Um, and the reason that the trail doesn't start at the beautiful beach is there was this patch of private property here. Um, it's now been purchased, and, uh, I th I, and I think down the road it's going to transfer into um, into park hands, and so the possibility exists to actually put the trailhead at this nice beach. Um, and uh, there are some issues; these switchbacks are fairly old. There are some issues with those. So one of the things that we can hopefully have some time to talk about is the possibility of rerouting the start and maybe some of the switchbacks. Um, as you go up the ridge, there are some nice views. There's one site, which I think is like in this area that has this beautiful view out towards Halibut Cove. Um, there are no views out towards the lake early on. Um, you get something of a view up here, but you're actually, it's actually not an optimal view out towards the lake because there's this bench land underneath you. Um, I, I'm kind of intrigued by, you know, if in order to make a more sustainable trail, we may well, well want to get off the ridge in various places and take advantage of side slopes. So doing that while also looking for good viewpoints. Um, and uh, I like I like it when we can get a good viewpoint on a corner. So people are kind of lured to go all the way out around a corner um, rather than thinking about uh, shortcuts. Um, and so you, maybe a double benefit in that sort of design. And so I'm hoping that we can find alignments that would have views early on looking out towards Halibut Cove and then probably the most dramatic uh, thing that I'm going to propose here is that we actually abandon this summit. Um, it's uh, it's a bunch of additional climb if you're you know headed further down the trail, 
Uh, it's a really has a lot of tundra braiding problems. And um, by abandoning it, we can go more into this area here and take advantage of some of the potential views uh, looking up the lake. Um, and I actually, so this is, uh, I'm just using Google Earth as a, uh, not an imperfect 3D view, but this would be views from like this area and here. So looking up towards the, towards the glacier in this direction. Um, but that's a big question, whether to abandon this existing destination, which uh, in some ways is really cool. And, um, uh, but yeah, anyway, so we can talk about that. The other idea, uh, so when we when we were first talking about this, Kathy brought up how much she loves picking blueberries in this area. And so uh, she got in my head the idea of a blueberry loop uh, having, you know, two two routes in this area, ultimately. Um, so I drew, uh, you'll see I drew that in as well. Um, and then there's the question of where exactly do you stop having a defined trail? And we can get into that in detail, but I'll just real quickly show so as you're getting up into this area, you start seeing these areas that have um, that aren't established tundra. They have gravel uh, protruding through the tundra, which shows up as this this uh, lighter color here. Um, and so at some point in here, I'm imagining the trail, uh, the the developed specific alignment would end, and then people would be able to spread out. But that we would want to choose that point quite carefully and. Uh, yeah, be an interesting point of discussion. Um, so yeah, I guess what questions either Gabe and Christine or questions slash comments, Eric, that, you know, as far as those broad, that broad picture of where the trail actually goes, uh, broad sweeps, what, what comes to mind for you? I guess I'll speak first. Um, the just for some background dealing with uh, from the saddle what i call the saddle lagoon trail junction okay. you know the, the top of the switchbacks um we are a couple things parks is in the going to be in the process this summer of going after rtp money to work on that and i am planning and i've already actually hiked your somewhat of your alignment oh, cool. once already um I can't wait for the snow to leave, but um, so that is because I do like the idea, at least with that portion of it, um, you know, just taking as much of the switchbacks out. It's just sort of like, they're just, you know, we can take them more out. That's great. Um, the private property, from what I understand, that is probably going to be conveyed, hopefully to the state, to state parks sometime by the end of 2023. Um with that, what I do see with going from the top down, I looking at your alignment pig is I could see this whole with the switchbacks. Um, I could see the whole um, project taking multiple years as in working down to a spot where it does intersect the existing trail and doing that in, in a in a stage. And then from there, working on getting over to that um, piece of property which I'm now starting to call the uh, the um, sultry beach just because it was an old sultry um, because that's going to be that is as you know is pretty steep a lot of rock outcrops that's going to be a lot more work and finesse that which as getting down to that last crossing of that slope you know when that first portion is, is being constructed gives time to do the rest of the layout. So that's where Parks is going with the saddle. So um, that's, yeah, that's where that's headed. Um, and then I think using the slopes up on the top are, is, is great and wearing on top of Alpine Ridge and continue to try to utilize that. And I think as we have seen in other places and I have seen in the park over years is that the better we can define an alignment to keep people as much as possible through a tundra area on there especially with the use in the park and the use that might be coming in 20 30 years from now the way more ahead we're going to have dealing with resource protection and all that and people like following lines and then it is just trying to figure out where in that rock area and i think bringing people up to that 
where you're pretty much out of you know the tundra where people then totally spread out if they want to go keep going back on the ridge and all that yeah one um one comment i wanted to make was just um we've had a little bit of experience with um in alpine on alpine trails um changing a social trail alignment to a more sustainable alignment that doesn't go straight to a, a high point or a summit and it's i think as most people on this call know it's very hard to, so i think i we are tending to move away from the you it's know, very hard just to clarify it's very hard to change user patterns yeah. that are already yeah thank you um kind of targeted toward a certain destination yeah. so i i think um i used to feel like well if we if we provide a better design and a better trail and still get the buy-in that it's going somewhere cool with good views then that should solve the problem and people won't use the old one and i think the reality that we've bumped up against is that somebody will always keep using the old one it may be more of a road side problem than the, in this case i think the number of people there's a more effort to get here so maybe that changes some kind of the user psychology or just the volume of people I think we've had we had some issues uh or challenges with this type of thing like on mount ball for instance in eagle river and places like that where it is literally a backyard hike for um a large number of people so anyway just i think that sometimes um it's easy to get public buy-in or um land manager buy-in or or funding buy-in to say we're replacing a degraded fall line trail that's creating resource damage with a more sustainable trail but i think it's probably just more realistic to say we're adding a trail option that we hope will become the most popular and maybe the other one will um become faint but the idea of it going away may not be um, or replacing may not be um, always serving us well. I think we kind of got bit by that a couple times because, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a land manager was like, "Wait, I thought, <laughs> I, th I thought that th I thought that scar was going away." <laughs> but in, in reality, we made a new trail, which is great, but the <laughs> old one's still there. So um, just to kind of temper the way, even if it's just a matter of how you frame it with, you know, uh, um, I think it's helpful just to realize that it's pretty hard, especially in those fragile, you know, vegetation environments that it, it takes so long for those scars to go away that it'll probably never go away. And I mean, in, in the case that Gabe's talking about and in a couple other ones, um, there was actually a significant amount of money spent on rehab. And I think one of the sticking points became, you know, oh, you have an SCA crew out there all summer doing rehab on an old alignment and you quite literally have trail runners and military workout groups and whatever coming up behind them and chucking the tundra mats and removing the staking. And so it just feels like a giant waste of money. Um, I that said, it doesn't seem like that's probably a plan up here anyway to invest a lot in the disappearance of a, a line. Um, but I think Gabe's point still remains um, just the psychology of whether it's seen as a success or not to, you know, spin it one way or as opposed to another. One thing I will say, though, is that the law of averages seems to, well, it's not the law of averages. Another rule of average of use, user statistics is that um Probably 80% of people will start taking a better route right away. This isn't, I don't have data on this, but just from my viewing, out of every 10 people who walk by something we've made better, a large majority of people are actually looking for, like Eric said, they want to follow a line, they want to look up from their feet, they want to make some progress. And then you have another 20% that will, part of them will take longer to make the change, but will eventually and a small part of them, maybe five to 10%, depending on the demographics, will keep going the old way, whether because it's a road less traveled or a challenge or they're used to the old thing. Even without rehab, the diminishment of a user of an old alignment from 100 users to five users can make a huge difference in 
in feeling like it it isn't at least degrading further. So none of that is conclusive for what we should do here, but it's just kind of some good background stuff to consider. Yeah, yeah. I, I was reason I was fiddling with different images and none of them are really quite doing what I'd like. So uh, one thing that bothers me a lot, and I think most people don't notice about my map, uh, but I bet you you guys do notice is that it has this nice color scheme that sort of suggests different vegetation. However, the data sucks in this case. Uh, it's very frustrating. Uh, this was a huge investment by the federal government to generate this data layer and it and supposedly ground truth and everything. And it, I was very excited when it came out and it turns out to be really inaccurate. So it does not actually show very well where there is brush and not. Um, but the I, I've thought a lot about, you know, what you're what you're saying there. And, um, you know, for example, this this summit here on this end, you'd be diverting in thick alder. And I think that diverting people is easy. You know, that's 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 no problem. Up here, that's where that question comes in for the uh, person returning. However, you can divert them before climbing on their way down. And I think it's more feasible there, especially if you can cover, like if you've got an upslope here and then you're going to divert in a flat or downslope over there. And if you remediate just some of this upslope, um, then maybe then you have some, some hope there. Um, so that would be... Uh, That'd that would that's ideal actually to hear i'm glad to hear that i meant to ask at the beginning if you could give a little sense of the how clearly the tundra slash encroaching veg was was um yeah was showing up in reality based on reality but i think the point you just made is a really important one we tend to have the best luck when the entry point from below where the reroute is still an unknown where that's very clear or clearly better or clearly more appealing then when you have people coming from the other way, especially with here, that's just an out and back. It's not like you're going to have loop users entering from the high point. At that point, people already know they got what they wanted. They know that the other alternatives sucked and they're happy to go back the way they came. Um, and the alder, which is a lot of times the bane of our existence, is an excellent ally to have because you have to really want to make a point to use an old alignment through through alder when there's a better or sustainable grade. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, that's another that's another good um, uh, that's another thing that makes me think what you mentioned earlier about staging your work from the top down makes a lot of sense that way because you um, in addition to the the lower portion that Eric mentioned where the if we um, traversed our way out of the switchback problem once the land becomes state parks at the end of 2023. If you started at the top, you could work your way so that, that this gateway we're talking about now would be continuous. You wouldn't have users who were getting to a dead end point and then giving up on the the betterness of it. You know what I mean? You'd have a chance to open it up all the way until it popped out and people could clearly follow it. You wouldn't have seasons where a different user pattern was kind of half and half. And then by the time you got all the way to the bottom, you'd have the calendar year where you actually had complete permission to do ground disturbance in the area that's not fully owned yet. So I'm hearing this as another um, check mark to that that makes a lot of sense for the staging of the work. One way I, I've started talk, thinking about and talking about uh, uh, trail design is if you kind of put your think of it as like a conversation with the user and so the user starts walking somewhere and they experience certain patterns of trail design um, and ideally what you do is you develop a, a, a sense of trust in that user that it's like well <clears throat> this corner felt a little odd when i went around it but now i see why we did that it makes sense to me and so the next time i reach a corner I'm going to trust the trail designer that, yeah, this is actually a good idea. And that's the ideal that I, I think it's, it's, it's useful to strive for is that you're, you're kind of, uh, yeah, you have a, a very friendly relationship with your user um, and, uh, and a trusting one. And, um, and I see trails go both ways on that. Um, uh, so I, I think that speaks to the same, the same sorts of questions. You don't, like if you just confuse them by having some, you know, a, a trail that has one side. I know we have one spot on uh, the climb 
on one climb anyway, where we put in all these corners, um, which I'm not as happy as I'd like to be about them. There was one section where uh, um, we went much more steeply up. And actually, I, maybe it was even, I remember Stan saying this, is like asking me like, okay, wait a second. I went through all these corners and all of a sudden it goes up really steep. What's the story there? And there's a whole reason for that. And like, uh, you know, that isn't important here, but I, it just, it just was interesting to hear that sense of confusion from users uh, that were hiking up this trail. And then all of a sudden the trail behaved really differently. Um, and that, that, uh, you know, I think that that is, that kind of damages that, that pattern. Um, let's see, I want to look uh, at quick, my, go for it. quick, uh, aside on that. Uh, I know we need to keep <laughs> moving here, but the, um, I think that's one of the reasons that whenever possible, when we're doing a, you know, designing a direction reversing turn that we choose a climbing turn, sweep turn, as opposed to a switchback, because when you bring the user to a stop, when you, you lose, functionally lose all your momentum, which just inevitably occurs on switchbacks, more or less, then they're deciding. And so if there's an, you know, as opposed to if you perpet maintain your momentum through the direction change, there's less of a, the user has to say yes or no, trust or not. Like you, you, you kind of... <laughs> uh drag or <laughs> propel or or uh, you know kind of convince them more subtly if if you uh and it seems like you guys are totally on board with that as well that those are uh there's a social kind of buy-in advantage to that, to uh, that well. yeah i think that's a really important point just that covers turns in a very obvious way but a lot of other design questions as well i'm glad it came up early is that you know, the ground and Mother Earth and the drainage and all that is the final say on design. That's why we have climbing turns, because they function much better and they tend to disrupt, you know, all the reasons that a lot of us already know. Um, but the the social capital, we call that, you know, you're building social capital with your user that then you have either at a deficit and you have to make it up or you have enough accrued that you can spend it later on something that isn't ideal and they'll go with you anyway. Um I think that a notable thing that Gabe's getting at the, the moment of pause on a switchback has to do with user ambivalence. And so the less user ambivalence we can create with design, the less chance there are that when those pauses happen, whether it's for a view, shed, a place you could do an alternate descent, uh, switchbacks to go or not, or cut or not, um, do like do not enter areas, whatever. Anytime we can avoid creating ambivalence, either with momentum stopping or with a sense of head scratching, we're more likely to get what we want for the terrain. And that's that's a good discussion to keep having. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, ultimately we're building this for the user. So <laughs> you want them to have a good experience. Yeah, 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 totally agreed. I, I think about bears a lot, uh, although that we're not actually building this for bears. Ultimately, there are a lot of bears. This is, you know, this whole area is some of the highest density of black bears you can find. And uh, and so I, I go through that that like pause kind of I, I hadn't framed it that way before, but I really like that Gabe. like. The, you know, where's that point where someone pauses and makes a decision and how is that potentially a problem? And like, I see that with bears really clearly, uh, you know, they, they get to a sharp corner and they're like, wait a second, I thought I was going up this mountain and now I'm going over there. Nah, I'm going this way. <laughs> you know, I like a trail, but not that much. And, uh, and so I really, you know, I, I have no idea really. I mean, I guess I have a little bit of an idea how well I do at this because I've seen some successes and failures, including bears going and flipping sod over. Like I've actually had bears come and like pull sod out of a remediated tundra trail. But, um, uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, I, I, I think about that quite a bit. Um, all right. So uh, is, is it okay to start diving into details a little more now? I just, yeah, we can, sure. but I just wanted to make one comment and just dealing back up on top of dealing where the viewpoint is now. And I think, Hagen, Hagen, I did mention this to you, but like if, if even though the alignment, if an alignment changes getting up to that area, um, you know, bringing, bringing users, if there's a way to bring in users to that same spot, then you're also working with people that are just like we you know like taking taking family or friends up there and just going like there's this great viewpoint 
And if you can just still get there, be it if it was like this idea of maybe making a loop up there that that's incorporated with that, then you're satisfying everybody. The newer people that are there for a day or a couple days are going hiking and they're never going to come back. They don't know any difference. It's definitely more about the local where people want to go and have been going over the decades. Yeah. You know, listening to some of this conversation, I'm already like kind of wanting to make some changes to what I have drawn and ready to show. Um, my ideal is that you try to get something that in some ways is better uh, you know, as far as a view, because there are some limitations to this view <clears throat> that's also closer down in this area. Um, and, uh, and so then you have that proximal goal that if someone's like, yeah, I have two and a half hours and my, my boat will be here. And so they, they can get up there and get back and they have this amazing view. And I do like that idea some, but I heard, you know, I forget whether it was Eric or, or, or Gabe and Christine said, you know, oh, a flat spot for view. And I'm like, hey, the spot I picked is not really flat. And sure, you can go and maybe make it so that the trail, you know, is, 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 uh, you know, you can pause on the trail and appreciate the view. But I do think that that flat spot piece is one that I should have considered more. So anyway, we'll, we'll, I, I really want to have that, you know, chew on that one. I think there are some really big costs to making the trail go up over the summit. And so from my perspective that it's really appealing to go around it, just, just in terms of like, you know, alignment that, that keeps a low grade and all that sort of thing. So, um, so that's where my, you know, my temptation is to say, it, you know, is to abandon this, but I do think that's a central question and, and obviously, you know, should be questioned at, at, in many ways. <clears throat> um, yeah, I was just going to also say, it's just like, maybe it's incorporating both somehow, some way and yeah. you know, without being on the ground or taking a look and really walking through that area, you know, that's just, that's up for debate or not necessarily debate, but to discover Yep. where that could work so yep yep um I, yep i have a something just to throw out there and maybe this is for a whole nother thing but looking at the map um and all the discussion for future we're talking very future uh just uh maybe you even mentioned this before but on the map just below the a on alpine i'm like a you can tell I'm a real lay, layman here. The contour just below that, somewhere in there, is there a way to create a future route headed towards Gruink Lake? So I, I'm very uh, interested in this. Uh, and I have not drawn, I don't have a drawing of something like that, but I write on what I'm presenting today, but I have thought about it. I could probably pop it up. Um, I, you know, I think there may be a way up here. There are a bunch of additional questions in there. Um, and I actually think that that probably you're right we should mostly leave those aside but uh yeah. two things that make me really interested in that is one is i think the loop would be really popular so that would provide value and it would distribute people over more trail length but it also would potentially create an evacuation route um uh for tsunamis on on the shore and so this this area here is is at risk of tsunamis and fleeing up this trail there's no way you would escape uh before before a tsunami arrived so uh, you might you might if it's small enough so because there is some rise right at the beginning but if a large a larger tsunami there's 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 no chance so anyway i kind of like the idea there and you know ideally like finding a campsite that would have a view and stuff up here water is an issue so anyway there's a bunch of questions about that but i'm very interested in that topic uh i do kind of see it as out of scope right here yeah okay We'll table it for now, but I like that idea. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just show you briefly some of the data that I have uh, so that we kind of, I, I yeah, anyway, so we can start kind of thinking about how, um, how to use this data to look at an alignment. Um, let me see. I'm going to do it a little different. Um, and all right. Okay. So this is the LIDAR Hillshade. Um, I know several, you know, most of you are familiar with this, so I'm not going to go into much detail about what this is, but if we just kind of accept this as a map of the surface of the Earth, um, uh, that 
this one has a resolution each. So if I zoom way in and you can see the pixels, each pixel is one meter by one meter. So that's the resolution uh, we have here. It will tend to have um, some artifacts. It's not not a perfect representation of reality. If you get especially to thick brushy areas, it will start registering brush as bumps in the train that aren't real, um, but it's pretty good. It's, it's a pretty good data set. Um, viewed like this, uh, it's nice to look at, but there's a lot it doesn't show you. And the way I've mostly been looking at it is adding contours. So these contours uh, in white here are every two meters. Um, and I'm also coloring in areas using a color scheme where purple is pretty questionable as far as side slopes. So you're maybe getting into cliffs or very close to cliffs if you see purple. And then the yellows and reds are what I would consider fairly steep, but probably doable to cut a, 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 a tread into. So this might be like a 60, 80 percent. Let's see, do I have actual numbers I can give you off real quickly here? Um, uh, let's see, those are in degrees. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, so the, the colors come in at yellow at 38 degrees. Uh, which is somewhere around like 70 to 80 percent somewhere in there um so uh you know i i think of that as something where you want to start thinking about your side slope in a fairly serious way you're not going to necessarily be able to do a back slope on your trail uh in the way you'd like to that's one to one because the 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 terrain slope is too steep so those are kind of to flag the steeper areas um and there is one other way of looking at this, which is a totally different different uh, uh, way of going at it. But in this view, the dark areas are places that you might expect water issues, soil water issues. Um, I can explain a little bit of how that, that uh, is calculated, but it, in short, it's basically, if it's really flat, then you worry about that. But also if it has a lot of uphill slope that drains towards that point, so you can see it's like this, flat spot comes out as a real dark spot because it has drainage down into it and it's flat. So just the kind of place where you might expect uh, water to accumulate. So those are some of the different layers that I look at and you can see I can flip back and forth between those. Um, so that is the LIDAR um, and, I, and we'll get more into details in a moment here. I do also have, um, oops. That's not what I oh, and Hig, I just wanted to for for the, just the um, making sure that everyone on the call is on the same page. So that's in the kind of trail designer language. Those are all uh, things that we call control points. So they don't. It doesn't necessarily mean the trail can't go to the dark, poorly drained areas or to the yellow, red, or purple. Well, purple. It probably does mean they can't they can't go there, but but those are all things that like Christine was mentioning early on, like that's starting to shape where you can be and where you can't be. And you know, I think the Mike Shields term for the yellow and steeper, especially the yellow uh, slopes, is that's kind of the limit of the practical constructability. It doesn't mean it's it's impossible. It just means. Um, expensive, time consuming, harder to maintain, like avoid if possible. So anyway, just to, that's kind of what, you know, clearly in your process, like you're already building that capacity for control points and knowing where you're going to have places that are either challenging or need to be avoided or whatever. So that, that's a, that brings up a question that I've been wondering i feel yeah anyways it's just a a, a a a genuine uncertainty on my part i you know i've gone through and i've built some trails in those sorts of places where you get those extreme side slopes um i've had some some like sometimes i've had that really bite me um i had one one that like immediately after building the trail there was a huge blowdown event and it like just tore out this huge section of trail and we ended up having to spend a huge amount of effort to get this not not ideal uh, work around. It's still a bad spot that's going to continue to be a problem. And I regret regret that. I've also had places where there is exposed bedrock and we can go in there with 
a hammer drill and uh, start ledging things in. And I've seen that be, uh, you know, really sustainable. And actually, I've started kind of looking for that as a place to go. Um, and one of the interesting things, I think, is when you get to angle of repose, you know, like 80, 85 percent, somewhere in there, like slopes that are close to that, uh, they they have loose sediment underneath them and are steep. So when you build a trail, you're still in loose material, but they're really steep. So they'll tend to be that whether it's just a little bit of, of over exaggerated outslope or whether it's some dramatic failure, those are kind of prime spots for that. When you get even steeper, it can't be that steep unless there's bedrock really close to the surface. So if you're willing to go in and actually ledge that bedrock, which is very labor intensive, then you can actually get a really sustainable alignment. Or that's sort of how I've started thinking about it. And I'm wondering if you, yeah, how would you reframe that or think about that aspect? I mean, I think that's a really good point. Um, and we, we bumped up against that same thing in um, the Mendenhall Glacier wreck area in Juneau, um, that sometimes we actually gravitated towards the uh, pro, you know, quote unquote, prohibitively steep terrain because it was um, legible with rock breaking tools. Um, I think from just a general alignment standpoint, the big picture, avoid those areas um, if there's a lower slope angle, better soil, better aspect option. That That's more kind of in the big picture control point. If we can say, oh, well, here we've got a, you know, 22 percent south facing slope let's go there instead of <laughs> instead of the the cliff band but um yeah i think i think you're absolutely right that that is it's kind of a a, a deeper level of analysis of the terrain to say um if we don't have the option for um you know because of user group or destination or whatever else if we're constrained in a different way then that does that puts some of those um negative control point areas back on the table because of durable tread um, and actually low maintenance despite uh, a, a higher investment in construction cost through those areas if you're breaking rock. I think the safety aspect, depending on the user group, is an issue. You know, just the fall potential, um, slippery rock, what you know, those types of things. Um, but I that may be kind of further down the the path of the pros and cons that we that we need to get right now. But I think you're right. I mean, I think that's very, that's very true. And we've, um, you know, you can, you can definitely go a lot steeper and more direct when you're on bedrock um, and have it still stay sustainable. So if it, if that is uh, compatible with the kind of TMO and kind of design based goals of the trail um, and the trail classification and stuff, then yeah, I think that can be a great, a great option. Two things that I'd add to that overall discussion about s steep trails. One thing to keep in mind, or I mean, uh, bedrock allowing steep grade. Um, I think Mike uses the word practical constructability for a few different reasons. Um, one of which has to do with um, the time it takes. It's much, typically can be pretty expensive to do good rock work, whether it, you know, if you're in a spot where you're traversing across bedrock, for example, a lot's going to depend on what kind of rock it is. You need it to be breakable enough that you're not having to use excessive measures to get tread in, but not so frangible that your efforts are going to be uh, erodible, even though it's rock, if it's more shaley or, you know, breaks in plates or whatever. Um, so that's part of it. Just who, who do you have on hand? Do you have the expertise? Do you have the time? Do you have the tools? Can you get the tools out there? I mean, it's all of that kind of stuff has to do with practical constructability. And then, um, as Gabe said, what your TMO will tolerate, because if your TMO has thus far up to this imaginary spot, then, you know, 24 inches wide, and then all of a sudden you're going to build a bench that's quite a bit narrower than that because you're crossing rock. Is your user up for that? Is that, you know, okay within your larger design parameters? And then... Also, just the distinction between that we think about when we get to steep, rocky trails is the distinction between traversing full bench trail and what we call chutes and ladders trails. <laughs> Lots of times in remote areas with, uh, you know, class one to two um, routes, 
we think about anytime you have uh, steep sections of rock, you can almost get to the point where it's more of a clamber than it is a controlled 12% grade. You know, you crank the grade up steep enough that it's functioning more like, you know, you're walking along and then you're making a quick rise, which can be really, really helpful for getting past a, an obstacle, whether it's a immediate one or more of a like pervasive cliff band no go sort of scenario so that i think all those things just need to be taken into account you know what what the constructability feasibility is with what you have on hand um whether the long term whether the effort in the in the short term the work is going to bear out in the long term to be worth it and then which type of trail are you actually talking about and which one will accept will the ground accept in a more long-term manner does that make sense? I feel like I can kind of got a couple things conflated in one answer there, but yeah, awesome. yeah. I mean, one of one of the ways that I've I've been thinking about this is in this space. So this is terrain slope uh, going across the x-axis and trail grade on the y-axis. Um, and so, yeah, it you know, it's actually you can somewhat go into the white zone here because you can actually you know carve your way into the slope and get deeper and deeper into the slope. But in most cases, your terrain slope has to be uh, um, as steep or steeper than the trail grade, or the trail grade has to be less than. So anyway, basically, this space makes sense. And one of the lines that I've been putting on here is the seven inch rise or nine inch run stairs. So this is kind of the like, not necessarily the absolute maximum you can ever build like there are the, the existing wooden stairs at the start of the saddle trail are more one to one they're really steep and I, and every time i i see some tourist going up or down them i'm like you know like i'm i'm afraid for them um like, but <laughs> but generally i see this as kind of one of those lines that matters i've got um so this is kind of like some of how i think about it um but trying to like you know, think about all these different different ways of arranging information. I don't know if we want to dive very deeply into this, um, but but one of the this sort of little yellow band in here, that's that angle of repose, but there's still loose material. And so you don't have anything to bite into. And then there's kind of this band out here that you could, you know, theoretically ledge something in and it might be good. And I do tend to cap that you know, with those kind of conventional indoor stairs slope. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so it's just kind of a way of thinking about and arranging some of that. Um, there's like 12 different discussions to be had about what's on here. Um, I will. No, that's, super, that's super helpful. It's a really great um, yeah, that's visual a great metric. And I'm actually the only thing I was going to jump in and I'm, I see it now to, to note, I'm really glad you put it as the one third rule because we spend most of our time talking in Alaska to people who've gotten their primary trail design from IMBA. The, the one half rule so rarely works sustainably in Alaska that we find it to be functionally kind of a red herring. And we always talk about the one third rule. So I'm really glad to see that there just because of our saturation and weather events and long seasons of raininess. And there are lots of factors, but that I would, if I were doing it, I would I would make the one third rule for Alaska use. I would indicate that somehow as the benchmark as opposed to the half. But no, it's it's great. It's very readable yeah. visual. I really like that. I, I do too. It's because it, I'm very visual on top of that, just seeing seeing all that. And I do agree with Gabe and Christine. You know, I with the one third rule, because dealing with the half rule and slopes, it just never really works out. That's why when when I look at TMOs I've developed and stuff like that, you know, it it's the grades are low and there's a cap to it for what I work in. And it's just like we should not go over this. You know, if you're just doing traditional layout and traditional full bench construction, you know, and once you get into other things like dealing with bedrock and other types of soils, and you know, you that's where you play. That's kind of where you figure out can you do this, can you not do this and all that. Yeah, yeah, there's, I don't know, there's so many interesting, I I've, I find this really useful. I'm glad you guys too, do too. I it's I want to kind of develop some tools that interact more directly with the space. And I haven't quite gotten there. Um, but what those would, the basic idea would be that you could actually take a trail and just plot it up in the space. Um, 
and I'm actually not that far from doing it, but I don't I don't have it ready for us today. And I'll I'll just note that some of this comes. So this is Jeff Marion's work, and he really likes to uh, use this this framing of trail slope alignment, um, and kind of says sort of what what Eric was just saying there that like you know that you think about. Uh, so like 60% is that's the one half rule TSA of 60% equals one half uh, half rule. So um, he puts that, you know, at the upper end of the kind of mediocre and then prefers uh, going um, or actually, no, sorry, that's the lower end of the mediocre the way he has it here. But um, I also one of the issues with his work is he's working in the Appalachians. And so he has no data at all for trails that are over 20% <laughs> or no data at all for 20 over, greater than 20% and uh, and what you would cons conventionally consider uh, a, a good TSA. Um, anyway. It's interesting too, when uh, we've come up against this a lot with working in East Coast versus West and the far North is so much depends on the age of the landscape, you know, and how the Appalachian, the Smokies, um, even, you know, uh, really anything west or uh sorry east of the mississippi the the lack of recent glaciation the less sort of instability in the landscape allows them to have more predictable even for things like stream crossings and whether water's going to find a new way or i mean in geologic time it you know i'm not the expert on that but those decisions have largely been made in the more dramatic fashion more of the time on the east coast and so we run into different when we base our metrics on what they can get away with and in, in, in an older um when we're in a younger terrain it can be kind of dangerous dangerously alluring and then often uh <laughs> like oh <laughs> so i'm sure as a geologist you know way more about that kind of percentages of the likelihood of those failures than i do but at least good to think about yeah well i mean i, I think that uh yeah, I can provide some explanations when I <laughs> usually after the fact when I stumble into something. Um, OK, I wanted to show one more thing here before we get into looking at specific alignments. And that's just that I do have this really high resolution photo. And so this is a 20 centimeter resolution photo. It's a little blurry at 20 centimeters. And oh, by, by the way, the line that's in here is just the existing trail. So this is not a proposed alignment at all. Um, if I turn that off, we might even see it. Oh, yeah. So you can kind of see it here. You can just barely pick it out. Um, it's just it's real faint, <laughs> but there are a few little light spots where it's wearing through the through the tundra there. Um, and so we do have this, too. Uh, and so that gives a it kind of gives a whole set of different ways of looking at it. I want to show one more. Let's see. We'll turn that trail back on, turn the LIDAR back on. Um, what? I have been doing, let's see, uh, let's actually turn this off and turn that version of the trail on. Is this going to work? Yeah, okay. So these colored dots overlaying the trail are, um, in this case, uh, they're uh, estimates of grade um, on a fairly, it's every five feet is where the dots are. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit smoothed. Uh, so it's not actually just a literal measurement every five feet off the LIDAR because there is all of these little terrain perturbations that are really bits of vegetation or just noise. They create like incredible, you know, short grades. So what I did is I went every five feet, but then I smoothed it over, you know, over some distance along the trail. And I kind of came up with my own category. So this is existing trail. Let's see here. Let's find a place that's more interesting. Maybe we'll go to. Um... Actually, I think that one's TSA, not grade. There we go. There's grade. OK, so. Um, so, yeah, uh, these white ones, uh, those are so flat. They're between negative uh, 5 percent and positive 5 percent. So they're basically flat. Um, I, I consider these, you know, you, you have to worry about puddles in that kind of slope. So so that's I kind of highlight those. I, I use putting a line around the dot to kind of indicate that's maybe a something you want to think twice about. Um, and then there are these grades in here that don't have a line around them. So like, um, sorry. So like these here, those are going from 5 to 10, 10 to... I think it's 10 to, let's see here, we can check real quick. Um, uh, 
let's see, five to 10, and there's 10 to 25. So those two categories um, are like, you know, maybe a lot of trails will be in that. When it starts getting to these darker colors, that's getting really quite steep. And then the when you get to the black and especially the fat black, these fat black ones correspond to places that are literally like just physically difficult to get up. So they're they're not it's it's not even in the remote realm of what you'd be talking about as far as a conventional trail design, unless you're building stairs. Um, they are they're like there's actually a spot I think it's right here where somebody went and they cut their own little tread to go like five feet off the trail and back onto it, like this tiny little switchback in the middle of this steep tread. I always wonder, I, every time I walk by it, I'm like, who was it that came out here and thought, I'm gonna bring a shovel in and build this like five foot bench that <laughs> has a little switchback. But it's it's like, if it's wet, I mean, it's literally just dangerous going along the trail in a spot like that. So that gives you kind of a spectrum. And I use this view, I would say actually broadly that you know you were talking about control points and such and 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 that's kind of how i'm thinking another way of framing it that i've found useful for myself as i draw this is i'll draw something and then i run these different analyses i look at them with different ways of coloring it and that for forces me to reconsider different pieces so i come up with an alignment i'm like oh this looks pretty good i'm looking at the grade for a while say and the grades are all nice and stuff and then i'm like well let's slap the water you know, table thing on there. And I'm like, oh boy, I went right through this big blue spot. Maybe, maybe I should reconsider that. And then I try something different. And then I turn on the imagery and I'm like, ah, geez, I didn't realize, you know, there's something funny going on here as far as what I can see in the imagery. And then I reconsider it again. So that's the kind of iteration I've done quite a bit. Um, does that kind of make sense as uh, kind of some of the tools I'm using? <clears throat> okay, so let's go ahead. I'll turn it off, turn it this way. So the, the route that I have that's proposed, and I have a couple versions in some cases, is the thin black line. So you can see in some cases it uses existing trail. <clears throat> in other cases, so like here, I've like drawn an alternate to the existing trail, but also left the existing trail as an option. So, you know, we can kind of have, you know, I'm, I'm doing the analysis on both of them. Um, other places, I'm just way off the existing trail, putting in corners here. Um, <clears throat> some places, regardless of, you know, maybe you say, well, this is problematic, but I just think that it's probably not worth rerouting this part of trail. There's so many options, you could totally do it. But, um, uh, and so I've come up with, with alignments going all the way up. Most of the places where you see, see two are alternates, like these are two alternates here. Do you put in three corners or do you just put in one corner? Um, this though is this is the loop idea that I've been exploring. So this I'm actually imagining as being two trails that would be built. Um, and uh, so what we can do with this um, is then I can take and kind of color it in the same way as we were doing um, as I was coloring the the existing trail. Now the um, uh, the yellow outline is what I'm currently thinking of as my preferred route. And the gray outline is another alternative. Um, and so I tried to pick a single preferred route just from my perspective. Um, and I think what I wrote in my, in my, well, so first of all, questions immediately at this point. I, do, I, I have one Great question. Just dealing with you showing this the saddle thing. Could you put the existing alignment there? Okay. No, that's 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 good. Cause I I your yellow, I kind of hiked. That's what I hiked. Okay. And and all. Um so yeah, to get it just gives me an there. idea because I had the I had the lower one mm -hmm. actually from the stuff that you gave me earlier this year the gray but actually going further off toward the west but yeah I, I i drew this fairly recently uh it it has this really steep part at the beginning the idea being that you would use stairs in that area um and so that's the question that i had you know with that and i'm really looking forward to going and walking around it and um uh, but yeah, is it worth just pushing to a higher elevation right off the bat? You've got your best access right at the beach. So building trails is, or stairs is relatively easy. I mean, if you build wooden stairs, maybe you're even deconstructing, 
you know, over here, um, you, presumably doing it at a time when it's not too much use, uh, <clears throat> and then building stairs up there, something like that. Um, but okay, first of all, high level as far as workflow now, do we want to start at the bottom here? I think that's what I proposed in my agenda, but I'd be happy to start at either end. I think it'd be nice to kind of start marching through. Anyone have thoughts there? I don't necessarily. It could be either end. So I also have some some notes here. I guess we've already started talking about this, so let's just dive into it. Um, and I do have a few photos. So, uh, okay. So this is this I, after the after the conference that a number of us were at. Um, I I decided I should probably think more carefully about grade reversals than I had been before. So I have done a revision of this where, I, I mean, I, before I was like, ah, you know, we're kind of averaging those out. But this one, actually, I tried to go in and actually put them in explicitly. I think it really, you have to have at least this good of data, preferably better before you get to that level of detail. But I do think this data is good enough. So I, I'm going to show a little bit of this alignment and I want to focus in on, on kind of that grade reversal thinking. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can show a couple pictures here. I'm not like so amazingly organized here, but um, uh, so this is, this is, if we take a look at um, the image, you get some sense. Uh, so there's this nice beach down here. There's actually a little cabin on that bit of property up here. The image, I think is actually slightly misaligned here. Um, this actually does start at the beach. Um, uh, so this would be starting kind of at the really easy to come land at smooth beach. Uh, the Sultry Beach, is that what you're calling it, Eric? Yeah, that's just a name. I'm coming up with like a name for everything in the park. <laughs> <laughs> well, these things, you know, I, I could put it on my map and then all of a sudden people will start using it. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, so yeah, you come into here and then initially, I mean, I love stone stairs, so I could see this being, you know, stone stairs coming up underneath this little cliff. And so I kind of like starting here because I actually have a picture of that little cliff. Let's see, there's the little cabin and the slope behind it. All right. So what I just showed, this is the, this is the little cliff that shows up as that, that purple bit. And so this would be the alignment, the upper end of those stairs would be coming right through here. I might even have one more. So that's, uh, I think, anyway, this is very near to the same spot. I think that's the cliff back there. So we're, you know, 50 feet further along looking back. Um, and then these are some of the gullies in that area that, you know, would necessitate dealing with the water coming down these. I don't think they flow all the time, but they're actually, some of them do have fairly persistent uh, water flow in them. Um, and then that's the trail. Uh, I think this is where the lower alignment of those two I showed would join, would be coming in right here on the existing trail. Um, so yeah, again, there's that. I showed the picture of this, this cliff. And so, yeah, how do you think about a grade reversal in here? So these contours are a little jaggy, and the reason is that it's such a big file that I simplified them. I've now gone to using a slightly less simplified version for other places I'm looking at. But uh, yeah, anyway, I haven't made my computer do the work of redoing it here, um, but it kind of bothers me that they're as jaggy as they are. However, you see, we go up, we cross this contour, we go about a third of the way to the next contour. These are two meters, so that would be about two feet above this contour. And then as we cross this gully, we go back to that contour. So that's about a two foot grade reversal. This one looks like the way I drew it is maybe similar because we're going underneath that contour there. Um, so we kind of climb up and then we drop down a little bit into the gully and then we start climbing up the other side. Um, and it goes along like that. So I, I, I kind of take advantage of those. There are places like this where, you know, this is like, it, it looks according to the data, I wanna go walk this, but in the data, it looks like there's a little bit of a bench in the middle of a cliff. So this is like probably strip all the soil off and probably do some modification of the rock underneath in order to get a, a ledge in there is my guess. It's a fairly significant bit of steep slope to work through. There are places like this where you're on top of a cliff. Um, 
which for water is great, uh, um, but it may be that you know you'd want to modify this based on uh, you know hiker safety questions, that sort of thing. Again, grade reversal in here. This one looks like it's actually would probably be about three and a half feet is the way I've drawn it. Um, and so I work along. Quick, hey, go for it. Hey, what's yep. the trail? What's the the running grade of the trail? What's the how steep are we climbing there on the? Okay. Trail? So um, there are a couple ways to look at that. Like depends on the averaging length, but uh, these the let's look at what our categories are so I don't get it wrong here. Okay, so I have a uh, five to ten, a ten to seventeen, and a seventeen to twenty-five are kind of some of the ones that we're looking at in here. Um, and so on the short scale, uh, you know, these are ones that are getting up over that 17, these two dots here that are a little darker. Most of these are under 17. These ones are down in the less than five uh, category. Now, we shouldn't take that literal every point because this is getting so detailed that you're really getting into the noise in the data. Um, I can... Uh, let me and, see. and just to be, I think I remember from your you talking at the conference. That's partly because you're plotting it um, using a slope angle uh, grade adjustment. So anywhere that you can go. So the assumption is that any place that you have 17 percent trail is at least a 35 percent side slope. Is that how that? Ah, uh, so yeah, that, so that that's that's uh, the um, the sort of automated process that Ian introduced, and I and I am not actually uh, this is not uh, directly derived from that. It is kind of oh, similar okay. thinking, but uh, it's not directly derived from that. Um, however, as we so the way I've approached it is a little bit more a little less automated, basically. So I will take and zoom out a little bit, and I. You know, look around here and I say, okay, wow, look at this. I went, you know, pretty steep through here. And so then I have a whole internal debate, which I'm now hoping becomes an external debate uh, about whether this would be a good idea. So in this case, we've got these dark dots. That means we're going at over 25% here. Um, we're also right on top of this bedrock cliff. Um, you know, I think it might be worth it to put the effort into making a sustainable alignment here. Um, and I think that the bedrock, because we know we have a cliff here, that that rock is just below the surface. But this would also be one of the questions I'd immediately be wanting to go out there and stand in this place. Imagine actually building that and say, mm, does that do I buy that? Um, and actually, one other one other thing that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable about putting a steep grade here is that we're just after a grade reversal. So the collection length of our trail is relatively short. Um, so that we don't expect water to be running from, you know, and it's pretty aggressive grade reversal. It's like three and a half feet here. Um, so we don't expect water coming down from above. We're really only dealing with just this little bit of collection area for water. And so this is where I would say, well, you know, this is the kind of debate I see ultimately happens in the field, but we maybe have the opportunity to start it right here as is does it actually make sense to push the grade that much as you go over the top of this little cliff or is this a control point we should be looking at a whole different alignment um anyway so I, yeah i'll throw that one out there um as as an example and specifically useful well i i wanted to just to say something about the kind of um the history of the grade reversal in, in trail design discussions. Like 15 years ago, um, when California State Parks um, trail folks came up, um, Eric will probably remember this, uh, the training that they they uh, did for a whole bunch of us in like, I don't even know, 2007 or something. But um, there are, there at one point were kind of two schools of thought about grade reversals. Some people, um, preferred to especially on motorized trails prescribe uh grade reversal spacing so depending on the user group the terrain the trail grade and whatnot you would have every 150 feet you'd have a, a grade reversal of certain length that was suitable to the um the user group um obviously getting larger for for faster moving traffic or motorized or whatever but but um 
and then other the other school of thought was no you you um you never prescribe a distance between grade reversals you put a grade reversal in a place that the terrain indicates there is a natural crenulation or a or a um a, a natural gully or drainage or whatever you're shedding water in um kind of harmony with the natural hydrologic um system that's already existing in that terrain so um and i think that um where where we've arrived which probably makes sense to most people just intuitively is that it's really it makes obviously if you're going to put one in and in your prescribed distance was 150 feet and then another 10 feet further you would have a natural drainage you would locate it there um so i think that that um putting a grade reversal in a place where there's natural drainage on the, in the terrain is um, absolutely is the way to go and makes sense as far as where else you need it. Um, yeah. I don't think that it makes sense to, um, to prescribe a distance between them, but I also think like the discussion that you're bringing up about, is there a way to shed water prior to this steep section of trail or immediately below this steep section of trail, some of those kinds of things um, are important to recognize that that's going to be an increased wear point. That's going to be a, um, a lot, a, a weak point in your drainage system. So, you know, that's not really an answer to that question. It's more just to say like for the point of discussion, like that's why well, I think where you, where you're locating these seems like it makes a great it makes total sense. And that's at a bare minimum, that's where they need to be as far as additional grade reversals, um, where they need to be located or if they need to be located in other spots. Some of that is, I think, like you said, it, it, it's more of an on site um, in the field decision because you can just see, but you can see things differently than you can at this level. But I think the, the level of detail you're able to access with this, these, some of this, data is is getting you closer to being able to put them in other places too two things i'd add to that same tenor of discussion is um i think gabe was getting at this but the way i think of the hybrid that we've come down on for citing grade reversals is that the the metric given you know for a, <clears throat> a you know 12 percent trail and you know whatever hiking um user type we want to have we want to shoot for a grade reversal every 200 feet that becomes a rule of thumb that you are um, comparing your ground travel against. So the ideal is you put in grade reversals where they make sense. And if one has not made sense within the last 200 feet, you put in another one. So it, it's like you're looking for your, your guiding points to be ones that are natural fits in the landscape. But if you're only waiting for those and it's been 200 feet since you've had one, then you put one in that's more based on distance if that makes sense. Um, it, it's like, I almost think of it as like, you know, yeah, you drink when you're thirsty, but then if I need about 10 glasses of water a day, sometimes I'm going to have to plan to drink one in between when I'm thirsty to know I'm hydrated or whatever. You know, it's like you're using a, the, 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 what makes sense and what's suggested by the ground, but you're not necessarily only doing that. And one thing that we do on, on jobs where we've had it, where the layout um, was, <clears throat> was a numerical determination like that where we had one job where we in the layout had to literally put a stake in the ground every 150 feet on the wheel that it was written was very, into very really rigid about it we had no room to be like well wait 10 feet further like they'd give you a ding on the alignment so um short of that not wanting to do that but knowing we had to provide for that we would have you know every 150 feet on the gps we would know we're to a spot where we need to be looking actively for the best spot within the next 10 feet or whatever so i think that your call outs here can function that way you know you can say these are places where i'm going to know to look for one and then it may be useful to put i don't know what your i i'm not familiar enough yet with your legend to know how far apart these grade reversals are but it might be useful if you are using the map as kind of a predictor and then you're ground truthing against it to first choose the ones you're citing as you are because they look like a good spot and then putting another dot in a question mark dot a different color dot that means this might be where uh 
a metrically based one needs to happen, even if the spot doesn't seem to suggest it, just so you don't get yourself into the um, habit of having gone a thousand feet without addressing the need for another one. Um, and then Gabe's point, I think, is a good one that he made about basically the way we talk about it is treating any overly steep or sudden change in grade as almost the way you would with a structure. So you'd never put in a, a climbing turn or switch back without thinking about drainage immediately above and below it, because it's going to wow. be a point of, um, it's going to be a point of more intensive construction. It's going to be a point of the user pause we were talking about. U users have that same thing with, with grade changes. There's a little moment of ambivalence, whether it's like, oh, I'm slowing down or like, oh man, I'm getting, it's getting steep. And then the wear pattern at the bottom, the way the friction happens in the change in grade is much more dramatic than the way it happens on a consistent grade. So anytime we have those types of sections, we always think about them draining them similarly to the way you would any high intensity use seg segment. I mean, I think that, um, I think that grade reversals get are thought of as, as just the, the more, um, you know, it's the more evolved version of, uh, you know, a, a digging a drain or a water bar kind of a thing. And obviously their primary purpose is to shed water off the trail and prevent erosion. Um, but the, I think another kind of side benefit of a grade reversal is just the kinesthetic variety that makes for a really nice trail walking experience. I think, again, just getting it, maybe this is deeper into the kind of design level um, trail discussion, but um, you know, I think it's, it's easy when you have, especially a single user group, like a hiker and you're, it's an Alpine trail and the goal is to get to the top and you want to get people there as quickly as you can. Um, obviously if that, if that's kind of the carrot that's keeping them plotting, but, um, we've all been on trails that feel like they're a, a slog or a grind. Um, and those experiences are ones in which the user starts to look for alternatives and the and trails that have kinesthetic variety i think you know we're we've kind of gotten more familiar with the fun of that from the mountain biking community and and the way mountain bike trails uh, are inherently designed that way because that's exactly what the user wants they don't want a, a straight climb even if it's only five percent they they want the the flow and variety but i think thinking of grade reversals um as not just places to shed water but also places to um create that kinesthetic variety is helpful and also it's another reason to do your kind of average grade mapping grade um at a lower grade than what your target grade is for the experience because it gives you the option um, you know, to avoid minor control points or trees or, or things that you want, want to preserve. But I think, I mean, it looks to me like just on your color coding on dots that you have kind of built into this alignment, even if it's not great reversals where you're descending on a primarily an ascending trail, but it, but you have flatter sections, steeper sections. And so that may kind of have the same function but just think it's helpful to think of the reversal as not just how few can i get away with or where is this absolutely demanded by the terrain but also um it will help create a certain kind of user experience maybe that's a luxury in um when you have limited funding <laughs> limited uh construct construction resources and you have a uh, kind of established uh, social trail that you're trying to deviate from that that has a directness that is hard to match with a sustainable alignment. But if you're far from the old alignment and you're designing from scratch, just that's something just to keep in the back of your head as a as a um, it, an experience enhancing and sustainability enhancing feature. And there and therefore the places where you call out, it's almost like we're making um, control points for grade reversals. We're we're finding places in the alignment where there's a nose or a climb or a, a valley or whatever drainage that those are control points to look to put grade reversals. And then by Gabe's um, aesthetic component, we're looking also for, you know, maybe places where there's a sudden grove of large trees and you want to drop below them so that you don't have to cut them. 
those are places to think about reversing grade for drainage purposes as well. So make sure you make it long enough that it functions like that. Or, you know, you're going to have a change in view shed. And so people will be looking upward and it's a good place to get them to drop up and down without feeling frustrated or they're coming in and then around something, all of those. And those are the decisions like Gabe was saying that are easier to feel for me with my body. I'm, I'm more of a body in the world person than a visual documentation of the world person. So people come down differently on that, but I can often feel something while I'm walking that I couldn't have told you from the map where I'm just like, it's, it's been too long. We need a, we need a change here, or this would feel better if it had a slight drop before the rise or whatever. So I really like thinking about this, what you're doing as we're making control points for grade reversals. And then we're being triggered if we, to think about them more, if we haven't encountered one in whatever our spacing is. Yeah, no, that 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 makes sense. I I've started, you know, when I'm talking about trail design at the most basic, you know, like kind of where do you start in the conversation about how to design a trail? And what I hear a lot of people do is they start with water and the flow of water. And and I I've started instead talking first about the flow of people. Like I I think that 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 in some ways can be a more useful starting point than the flow of water. Um, not that you don't want to talk about the flow of water. That's another whole important topic. But I think that in in my experience anyway, which of course is much more limited than some people on this call, um, uh, a lot of the problems come when there is some uh, some issue with the flow of people on the trail. And um, a lot of the erosion is really driven by the way people flow. Like you often talk about like that impact of slowing down and that that that's one and i think another another example one way i i think of it is that you're as a trail builder you're trying to foster agreement so you have different users with different thoughts about how to walk on a trail and if they approach a spot where there's a few rots roots and 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 rocks sticking out of the ground it turns out that people all disagree and you get this huge spreading of the trail it doesn't matter that it has good grade and that the water is not an issue. You have this eight foot wide swath of, you know, denuded ground that gets pro progressively rougher with time because, you know, people are stepping between or on or various different ways of going through those. And so that site where there is some, you know, roughness protruding through the soil turns out to be, you know, a, a challenging spot. Um, but that's completely obscured if you only focus on on water. Um, and uh, and so anyway, that's just an example of one of the places where I think that kind of flow of people sort of thinking, which is some of the 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 way you're talking about this too. I think it's useful. I would, yeah, and I would agree. I think I think taking the the water and the flow of people and how people use the trail should be relatively equal. The water is the physical realm that we're trying to um, mitigate and then but it's also how people are going to flow through it and then adding on what is the the level of the level of the hiker so to speak is it somebody that goes that hikes a lot is it a person that doesn't hike a lot what is their age what is their mobility you know do they have mobility issues that's going to add another factor to that whole flow rate which is what you're just talking about this all different people that look at things differently as a route or something that comes up in the middle of a trail and how they interact with that. I agree, Eric, with that. I, I, I like Hig where you're going with the user psychology. And I think the point you just made up about the places where braiding happens dovetails really well with what Gabe was saying earlier is that became a decision point. The user didn't think about it that way, but suddenly they were moved from uh, not autopilot, but cruise control into oh shit like do i upshift do i downshift where do i go and anytime we have a decision point humans know we're all going to make it differently so the agreement that's good to make the connection that agreement or lack of it is happening when a decision point happens so the less of those we can have and that's why grade reversal and and grade changes function so well when they're laid into the alignment they are they aren't a decision they're not a, oh i have to step up over this water bar or or not or uh, you know they they happen in the flow which is great. And I, I do, I, although I agree with you that we need to think about the user as the primary driver, I would echo what Eric's saying about the water. I can almost see this as a kind of a similar 
diagram that you had with the slope steepness or perhaps a Venn diagram of what the user wants and what water will do. And so we kind of know what the outliers of either of those are and where they overlap so that neither of them is being, you know, <laughs> is the is the driver, so to speak. We have a kind of a sense of the terrain that can accept the kind of outliers of both of those um, factors. I'm giving you a, since you're a good chart maker. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm, no, I'm I, giving you more idea. <laughs> we, we should collaborate on some of those. Uh, um, and maybe we should bring some, uh, when we, in July, we should have some some stuff to draw on um, to, to kind of draw some diagrams in the field. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to a different spot just, you know, partly to move us along, but also to, cause this, this was really good. This was, we, this kind of triggered a lot. And I, so I want to go to something else that, that, uh, maybe you guys will disagree with me right away and that will be good too. So, um, all right. So this is pretty simple. You see, there's an existing trail, just go straight up. It's actually in this gully here. You could probably, you know, it's one of these places where we go into the field, we could look at it and be like, well, maybe we just accept that the trail's here, it's been here, it's not worth rerouting. But I'm, you know, just laying out what could be a useful reroute. And what I really want to focus on is the way I laid out the corner, which um, I, I think is is maybe a, a point of potential active debate. So I'll explain my logic here, and then I want you guys to, like, jump in and tell me how I'm wrong. Um, uh, so... If you imagine coming down, I, I mean, I sometimes I like to imagine trails kind of separately going up and or corners kind of separately going up and down. But just to describe it going down, you're coming down a pretty normal. This is like, you know, some of this is is, you know, a little above 10. Some of it's, a, you know, it, it's not a super low gradient trail, but what I would consider, you know, fairly reasonable grade trail. And as you drop into the corner, it gets significantly steeper. So this little piece here, that's in that 17 to 25, I think category um so it's it's a relatively steep piece it's got this really sharp convexity you know above this little cliff so first of all i like it because uh there's not really a good option for bears to go off the end um it also does have some radius so we can actually measure this uh so that's nine feet across that so it's it's sharp but it does have some radius as far as being a climbing turn um, but I like this steep bit get coming in here because what I'm picturing doing is building, you know, probably taking either existing bedrock and such or actually setting some stones. And what I do there in those cases is I often set kind of stairs or even just pseudo stairs, what I call pseudo stairs that are on the inside of the corner. And so anyone who cuts around the stair, which of course often people try to cut around stairs, they cut around on the outside so they increase the radius of the turn rather than cutting on the inside. And so the people who want to go inside are stepping on rocks, the people on the outside are, are have a, a longer path, and this ends up eroding, you know, the human erosion is on that outside and so it keeps a shedding point for water. So if water was flowing down here, I think with just a little bit of stair work here, you could be reliably shedding it off this hard convexity here. And then by the time you get to the bottom of the corner, it all of a sudden becomes a lot less steep. This is low enough gradient here that if you needed to, you could put in a grade reversal, but I haven't explicitly mapped one here. Um, and uh, and then the last piece that I see here is that, you know, maybe you could, let's, we can pull up the image real quick, just see what, what kind of a spot that is. So it's got like, you know, some, some fairly small spruce trees, it looks like. And um, so you could actually clear a little bit here and make this one of the early viewpoints on the trail. And so this would help attract, you know, provides value in and of itself, but also tracks people out to, you know, kind of gently walk around this corner rather than wondering about doing some shortcut down this really steep slope. So that's some of how I'm thinking. And I recognize this is fairly different in the sort of alignment you would do on a, like with a, a platform turn uh, um, uh, switchback. And it's also a lot steeper than when you would conventionally think about a climbing turn. I mean, these this the slope in here, I think would conventionally, you would say, no, that's not doable to do a climbing turn. And ultimately, I'm really looking forward to going out there and standing here and seeing whether I, I buy my own argument standing on, on this place. But anyway, I wanted to invite uh, uh, you guys to just kind of dig in and 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 tell me what you think of that mindset or approach. 
Well, first off, you'll be happy to know that this is not entirely uncommon. People refer to it as like a hybrid turn, uh, a halfback, I've heard it called, or a switch berm in mountain biking, which is the grades entry and exit are a little bit different. You're coming in steeply and exiting um, less so. But the idea of basically taking one leg to do one thing and the other leg to do another, whether we have places on trails we've built where we sited a turn site that had a perfect amount of slope for a switch uh, climbing turn on one end of it. And then it topped out in an area where you could scramble on bedrock or so on. And so sometimes you can actually site turns to go to places like that where it's a hybrid and, and that can be fine. So I think don't be put like, don't be red flagging it because it seems unorthodox. Like it, it's not at all, um, too much to say that you could kind of hybridize a turn in the right spot. Um, I do think whenever I, whenever I convince myself that my structure is going to do water management for me in a way that's a little bit unusual, I, I, ha I have to like, we have to hold ourselves to a really high standard that that's actually going to happen the way we think it does, because that's the thing about water is it, it's one of the elements we have the least control over, <clears throat> even when it tends to behave in a certain way in Alaska, there are every summer something behaves really erratically. <laughs> well, and, so. and also the predicting human behavior, too, that we like, I'm pretty sure that they'll see this. They won't want to step on these rocks. They're going to stay to the outside to make a larger radius. And then, you know, we come back to it and we go, well, there, I guess <laughs> there were the some, way people, I did. <laughs> some people did this. But yeah, I mean, that's just I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that. no, that's fine. But I, I think that that the way you're thinking seems completely reasonable to ground truth that I wouldn't. I wouldn't get my heart set on it, but I would say, yeah, I do think also the the opportunity for review, the way we were talking about pauses and decisions and user psychology, the way that we can make those work to our advantage often is is on in turns or at, at um, junctions, places where we actually would do better to have the traffic become slower and a bit more deliberative. So um, that could be a great component to, if, you if you're introducing a slightly different structure so to speak, um, it's not going to flow exactly like a climbing term, but it's not going to have the full pivot um, uh, turning table of a switchback either. The fact that there's a view there can help the user pause long enough to to do it without confusion. And oftentimes we'll actually cite the view shed as a positive control point for, for turns as well. In addition to, you know, we might have a lot of different control points that have climbing turn uh, feasibility and then we'll extra tag the ones that also have a view should change because they provide that secondary benefit so i mean to to, to like back up on the, the the sustainability the the aspect of a climbing turn of a of a kind of textbook climbing turn um the aspect of that that is providing the sustainability is um user user flow through the turn um because there's controlled grade so a classic there's a slope grade sweep turn which in this in the of the direction change you just uh, you adopt whatever the the side slope is there um it's not entrenched it's not in, it's turn. not entrenched but mm -hmm. a, but a you know a kind of classic sustainable climbing turn is uh, controlled grade so if you're eight percent or ten percent or whatever you are you maintain that all the way through and so that's why you're you're selecting somewhat low side slope below 22 ish 25 ish percent ideally locations and again for that, sorry those... to you. that's the construction feasibility thing you know mike has a lot of his turns diagrams where he shows a climbing turn built at way way steeper it's not that you can't do it it's just that the the feasibility of it's a ton of excavation so much i didn't yeah. mean to cut you off oh, no no, no that's fine <laughs> so so anyway i didn't want to take too much time with that but so i just want to kind of revisit so so that is the controlled grade through a climbing turn um which uh is kind of the main sustainability aspect of that of choosing that type and then so what what you have here um obviously is, does not have controlled grade in a classic way so then what we are often trying to do is say, okay, if I'm deviating from like the, the classic sustainable standard, um, how am I mitigating that lack of controlled grade? And in this case, 
the answer may be that you are switching from controlled grade being your kind of best sustainability feature to durable tread being the sustainability feature because you're on to bedrock. And, and that I'm not necessarily saying that this is the right choice here. I'm just saying that I think that that uh, checklist is what is helpful to to use for this type of thing is, OK, if I'm if I'm going to um, deviate from kind of the standard textbook option here, how am I mitigating the 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 lack of sustainability that my choice is moving toward? And, and what is, and oftentimes that's it, the durable tread, you can increase the grade. Um, you can do things that you um, couldn't otherwise do on in a different soil type if you're on to that bedrock, but just making sure that that's a conscious choice um, as opposed to, uh, you know, um, oh, oh geez, oh, here, oh, I guess we got to steepen it up, you know, whatever. And I mean, I, th I, I obviously you've thought this through, but I think, um, you know, leg separation is another thing for social trail and switchback cutting or turn cutting. Um, eight, an eight foot radius is still pretty small. And if there's suitable terrain and a way to increase that, um, you know, that's the first thing I think of just because it looks like there's a little more. Yeah, especially um, if there's a view there, you could area. incorporate a little bit more of a traditional um switchback platform on the lower end of that where you exit from the stairs into the yes yeah, so yeah. follow that contour yeah yeah exactly if you could get the grade you needed to still put a you wouldn't want it to come out too flat but you could probably figure out what um what that is but yeah i guess in a lot tagging along with what gabe was saying if you think about it from the bottom up you know you're coming along on more of a climbing turn and then you're reaching the point right there where yeah. you're like now durable tread becomes what i can bank on because i have the rock mm -hmm. but then to be sure you're thinking of the same thing in the opposite direction okay right here at that red dot where i'm losing durable tread am i being very clear to return to my controlled grade so you might end up with a turn that on that new leg you just drew was entrenched going into it with yeah, I forget you can't see me pointing at the screen. There, I got my hand. There should be a way that you. if you go down to the bottom, there should be an annotate. Uh, oh, it, and it's not that big of a deal. I can just yeah. describe it for now. But um, I, I'm a slow adopter with technology, so I better just stay on track here. <laughs> but yeah, basically, you would reach a point when you're climbing uphill where you would start to treat it like a climbing turn and mm -hmm. you would start entrenching to control your grade at. And I would probably want to dampen it because you're coming out of an unorthodox structure and where users are moving quickly. You might not want to push your grades in the lower part of the turn too high. You want to be closer to eight or whatever, as opposed to 10 or 12. And then that point where you're making the switch, you'd really want to be aware of, of the wear pattern stuff we were talking about. Maybe you would armor the tread in there for a step or two while you're coming from bedrock to back to grade. Um, not to micro focus on how you would solve it. I think Gabe's point is right that it would need to be looked at really carefully in the field. But I, I guess I don't want to give you the impression that it seems like a crazy idea. It's we I think we actually think about stuff like this more often than it seems from how you, trail turns can look fairly typical. But if you laid it out, you know, actually, we came in way steeper and exited less steep because of X or because we wanted to capture drainage here and not there or whatever. So I think that part seems totally feasible. Oh, it's super useful to listen to how you, you know, just like, uh, thanks for the like view into your brain. That's <laughs> how you think about these things. Like, um, yeah, so I, I, th I think what's maybe proving useful here and still thinking about the time too is like, if I pick points where, uh, yeah, where we can kind of trigger these kinds of discussions. I think it's maybe a little too much to go through every bit um, of the trail. Um, so I hey, will if, yep. if we're at a transition point, would everybody, could anybody else use just maybe a five minute pause sure. to kind of stretch our eyes and um, go take a bathroom break? <laughs> take a leak? I could, I could take a leak, yes. I don't want to curtail this discussion if we have more, but if we're going to switch anyway, you yep. spot. Okay, see you in five.
Now I appreciate the prompt for a pee break. <laughs> it's not just me that has to take a leak. Um. <laughs> Be nice if there was a way to like. I bet you there is. I don't, but a way that I could just hand the mouse off to you guys. So you could navigate and. <laughs> um. Yeah, and I I know that um, we're probably deviating a bit from the kind of initial agenda. So feel free to either direct or, or redirect if, if there's stuff that we're going to run out of time if you, you know i think some of it is we we can micro focus on any one particular place and if that's too much then you know just keep moving us along yeah i, I my thought is that these micro focuses are exactly what i feel is really valuable to me uh hopefully to the to the whole group um because they they like i mean that's they're getting into the level at which i'm thinking about this and the more that I can be like, I, I mean, ultimately I, you know, you were talking earlier about how much time do you spend fiddling with the digital uh, before you go out in the field? And, um, and ultimately you would want to optimize that at some level. I'm definitely not optimizing it right now. I'm fiddling digitally a lot more and that's not, you know, not just because I'm obsessive or whatever. It's also because this is an experiment in developing that iteration. And, uh, um, you know, Eric was saying he was just out there. I'm going to get a chance in about a week to be out and hopefully it'll be snow free on the lowest end anyway, and to actually go stand at some of these corners I've been thinking about. Um, and, you know, as I see it, you know, I don't know, a couple of years from now, I'll know what that balance is. Like <laughs> how much, how much do you go one way or another? But right now I'm, I'm, you know, partly it's winter and I, I, I can't go out and, and see the ground yet. And I've, a lot of this thought of how to use digital tools has been over the course of the winter. So, um, so I do see us, you know, this is a somewhat, this process is still somewhat biased towards over consideration of digital information because, uh, you know, for me, it's young and I'm trying some new approaches that are, are I think, new to everyone. So um, so it's just kind of like it's partly uh, partly about this specific trail, but it's also a lot about developing the approach. I mean, that makes sense. You're in the like beta testing phase of this particular portion of layout. It, you would have to spend a lot of time just seeing what the limitations are, what what you invested in that wasn't worth it and all of that. I And I certainly didn't mean to give the impression early when I said that, that this part of it is too much. It was more just oh, yeah. as we, as we gain a new, the use of a new tool thinking like you're already doing, okay, what part of that was, could I have had it off by more and what could I have saved myself making the decision till I was in the field? And yeah, I think it seems right on me to, to do more deliberation about it when we're first using it <laughs> and i just i want to just add in before we move on about um what gabe and christine um put in dealing with the, the corner that we were just talking about it is that you got to get on the ground you know if you can look at things on the map but it really is and you should not you should go in with really with an open mind and to also think outside the box and you know I was thinking exactly what, what Gabe was talking, Gabe or Christine, I can't remember at this point, but um, dealing with this flat, the flat area there, of you, utilizing that as that shift mm -hmm. of slowing the user down and, and all that, and as a, as a viewpoint, so. Yeah, well, Eric, maybe this is one that's low enough that we, you know, if, if we do manage to be in the field together in, in a week and a half or whatever, uh, um, that maybe we could even go and actually stand at this one and 
kind of yeah. revisit this discussion while it's still fairly fresh in our heads, which I think would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm willing to go to because when I saw this, the first thing that came into my mind is like, well, this it's okay. There's here's an idea, let's go see it. That's what I want to first do is is get on it. And it doesn't mean it's not a good idea. It just means I got to see it. Yeah, I, you know. So, well, okay. I guess uh, the only other thing I'd say about that is I I feel like we're always trying to find the balance too of of the digital tools and the and then the field-based ground true thing. And I feel like for me, I rarely get into the field and say to myself, I wish I had spent less time uh, <laughs> with the map, but, but I commonly have said, oh, I wish I would have uh, really, re really done the legwork on at the map level to, to understand this piece of terrain as much as possible because it's so easy to forget that when you're climbing over you know beetle kill down logs and you're in the alder and you just really do get that tunnel vision and this this higher level landscape view especially with the kind of you know digital the, the options that we have now with google earth and 3d view and then of course all the the lidar and the you know um you know, like what Betsy's bringing to the table too. Uh, that 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 is something that you know, we, like I haven't really had the luxury of even having that available to me, and I probably don't even know how to use most of it. But but it's uh, yeah, I, I think as terms of plotting with the contour levels at this level of detail and having an alignment that you want to go ground truth, so that you have a list of questions to say. I want to walk this line. I want to look at this. I want to look at this as opposed to a broad landscape canvas. Um, you know, I think Christ, uh, I think we, Christine and I have made it clear that our, I'd much rather be in the field than on a computer. So I, I would, that's always been my default. It's like, eh, I'm not sure, but let's go look at it. And, and uh, that still will probably always be the final, you have to have the final look on the ground, but the more legwork you can do to at least have a hypothesis you're working against. Um, I, I do think that's a, an efficient way to, to do it. And I would add, you know, one, one thing that we use typically, no matter what level of technology we're using, we always go into any design ground truthing with an idea we're pretty sure can work based on what we've had access to. Um, a second way to tweak that a little, and then a, a quote wild hair idea. And so I think in some ways what the technology allows is for you, it, it could allow you to get more tunnel vision because you think you've worked out, not you, but collective, we sure. think we've yeah. worked out everything. So that's dangerous, I think. But the the ability to just try a wild hair is so easy with technology that I think that's one good way to mitigate the the sense of fixity we might get from having figured prefigured a lot is to have a wild hair idea from the digital level every time you're ground truthing something that you feel more committed to because it just prevents the very human tendency to um to uh what's it called confirmation bias where we've spent enough on something that we really want it to work and then we start seeing the ground in a way that can help us prove that what we thought was going to work um I think that could be a real upside to it is thinking about how do we build in the certainty diffuser options in any given ground truthing process from the digital angle as well. Well, and I think like some of it is what's the question you're asking when you get into the field to ground truth? Am I going out there to prove that the line I drew on the map is right? Or am I going out there to prove that the line I drew on the map is wrong? Or am I going out there to poke holes in some aspect? You know, I mean, it does matter which, am I going out to be like, I knew it, <laughs> or, uh, you know, I knew it, I was right, or I knew it, I was wrong, or, you know, so the level of investment at the map level um, changes how we approach finding a problem with, with it when we get into the field. It's, but if you find a problem in the first quarter mile, and that's what that, you were hoping to do. <laughs> that, that, and that's what you're hoping to do. You feel like you succeeded if you find a problem in the first quarter mile that takes the rest of your alignment off the table. Um, you feel like, oh, did that mean? Does that mean I wasted my time? Uh, you know, with the map. So, anyway, that's more of a big picture thing. But 
<laughs> oh, I think those are great points. And I, I mean, it's already making me think like I need to like, like, you know, that sort of wild hair versus like a plan kind of mindset, like maybe having more of like, you know, and I do have alternate routes, like what we saw at the beginning and stuff like, but maybe more of that, like I, I'm, I've been trying to figure out what the right balance is of, you know, drawing something that kind of can, you know, when you draw a single route, I think it helps uh, develop a certain mindset, which can be really useful of like, okay, this is something real we're talking about. Whereas if you have a whole braided network, then it's like, who knows, we could do anything. But I think that there's a problem with the, you know, that I didn't put as many alternatives as at one point. I mean, I've drawn a lot of alternatives over time, but I didn't display as many of them here. And I think that that a problem with that is that that can give us some of that tunnel vision. And, uh, and I need to be thinking about that aspect too. Um, yeah. I, I think it's helpful to, <clears throat> to think about the wild hair idea as one, the entire point of it is, to not have it be over researched. It exists as kind of a pressure release valve in the field. Can't tell you how many times we've gotten, you know, pretty far into an alignment that we thought was going to go. And we're, we've are we got all systems go toward that end. We're really excited. And we reach a, 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 some sort of stumbling block that we didn't foresee, whether not specifics don't matter. And the wild hair exists primarily just as well are we to the point yet where we need to go look at the wild hair or is like the wild hair is practically a member of our crew joking. We're like, Oh, you know, what is this? Does the wild hair need lunch or whatever. It has the kind of almost more like the philosophical um, exist uh, purpose to be so that you don't feel like you're locked into something. You always have something else you are ready to try. So it might not necessarily even be good to give it the same level of prefiguring as your other main two options, but you know that you've got another idea. <clears throat> All right. So I wanted to, um, I thought maybe it'd be worth just, just like completely focusing on the grade question for a moment. Um, and uh, so I was, let's see, I can actually take, and we can look at one of these points. So pick a kind of dark one that the, the um, this, let's see, this R9 grade is probably that's what's actually coloring it. So in this case, these are in percent. So 18.5% is what this one relatively dark, but still not like overemphasized sort of dot is. And so I wanted to kind of just drill in on the overall mindset of grade. I, I could, I, I don't have it set up quite as easily as I could. Oh, we can kind of look at this. So these are profiles that are extracted from the same route. Um, unfortunately, the naming kind of sucks, and I don't have this as well organized as as uh, as might be useful uh, to really prompt this discussion. But I'm just going to use it anyway as just a really quick thing, so you can look at this. Is just assume this is some alignment. We don't won't worry about which one it is right now, but we can actually take and run a line along here. And so that one averages eight degrees, so that would be you know around fifteen percent over the long distance, you know, um, and so. And you can see, you know, there are steeper parts and there are less steep parts, but that's quite a bit more than 10%. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, this one maybe does get down to that level, you know, four degrees. So that's under 10% over the long, long average. Um, uh, so um, when we're looking at these, I would say, you know, I, I, one thing I wish I had is like maybe some labels that were, you know, that average over a thousand feet, what is the, what is the grade? And maybe that's something I can add in the future, but I'm guessing that the, the average in here is probably over 10%, you know, it's probably somewhere in the 14 ish percent average going along this section. This area has a pretty steep side slope, but it's, you know, under angle of repose. Uh, I think it's probably doable to just cut in a conventional tread here. Um, but I, I, I've been listening at the conference, like John's presentation, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of this, like talk about like, well, we're just going to go for 10% or left less in, in most cases. And like, we can have a discussion if we're going to go outside that, but most cases, that's what we're aiming for. I feel, uh, some of my mindset going into this has been steeper than that. 
And the reason is, um, I think in a big part of it is just the amount of trail you end up having to maintain. And I think that when we talk about grade, like any benefits of reduced grade, you need to be balancing those against the costs of increased length, which, you know, some of those costs are literally how much, how far does Kathy have to work, walk with her brush muncher in order to clear it. But they're also, the time that the hiker spends on a part of the trail they may not care about, you know, how much they feel like they're getting where they're going versus versus kind of zigzagging across the slope. It also has to do with how many corners you have to put in. So there are a bunch of costs that I think need to be, in my opinion, should be balanced when we're thinking about what our overall grade is. And so anyway, I that kind of thought process has been a part of how I've laid this out. And so I, I want to give you the guys the chance to like, set me straight or or give me nuance to how I think about that or whatever you think would be useful there. I mean, I think that I think that you're absolutely right that it's not as simple as it's it's not a single factor that's driving um, the grade choice. I think that there was um, from a land management perspective, I think a lot of times um, you know, if you have a well-written trail design worksheet or a TMO, you could, in theory, come up with a maximum sustainable grade for a trail, which takes into account a number of those different factors that you're talking about. Who's the who's the user? What the trail classification is, um, which you know combines to create a certain kind of experience that you're designing for. So. For certain user types and um, certain trail classifications, 15% would be inappropriate. And so there is a management level decision that would just answer that uh, for you. I think there's another nuance that affects the maximum sustainable grade on any one particular trail or in any terrain type. And that is kind of a moving target, which is uh, aspect, elevation, and soil type. And that, over the course of any given trail, that may change quite a bit. Um, in uh, an alpine trail like this, th it very much changes. I mean, obviously, you're starting at sea level and you're finishing at, you know, the alpine. So your soil type, your aspect and elevation, and all of that are going to change over the over the length of the trail. And in some cases your user type or user group may change over the course of the trail as well because there may be a, a secondary destination the the day hiker um it, less experienced hiker may stop at a certain point where there's a great vista and then they descend back the way they came and the more advanced people who can handle a lower class steeper grades and all of that will continue on ideally a tmo or some kind of guiding management document could could ca uh, capture that classification change or standards design standard change over the course of a trail like this um so i mean i think i think that you're i think that you're right in in that just assigning a blanket number for every trail uh for all trails i mean <laughs> you you know that to say all trails should be eight to ten percent grade it isn't right that that is um that's true for a lot of trails if you want a certain kind of experience and a certain level of sustainability i think the maintenance aspect you're talking about you know the lower graded trails may have less issues with water and erosion but depending on the terrain they may have a longer trail that's primary maintenance issue is brushing um, is going to have a higher maintenance cost because you have more, like you said, a longer trail. It's just more, more feet of trail to brush. Um, but there is a sweet spot there with the balance of the steeper it gets, the more possibility for water and erosion issues you're going to create, and which are in the long run more expensive maintenance uh, costs if you have a water problem than if you have a brush problem. So well, and the, and the potential for catastrophic failure is higher. I think that's yeah. one of the things. I mean, the way I think about it is, did I no, just cut you no, off? No, no, go, go for it. Um, 
you mentioned John's use of 10, like, well, functionally, we, you know, often use eight to 10. And I think a couple things are going on there. One is you were taking the, um, that was the 101 sustainability uh, sh slideshow he was doing, I believe, right? <clears throat> and uh, the least nuanced But we're version doing that. That version is okay. creating a template that can be taken by anybody who goes for an hour and a half to this. And if what they get from it is, yeah, eight or 10% trail is pretty good that is a very good starting point because people um i think of it a little bit as like the working load limits on towing or, or climbing or rigging equipment you know the safety it, it actually you could you could haul two and a half tons with it but nobody wants to plan on that so the t eight to ten percent grade to me is like that this is the kind of most of the time, in many cases, when nothing is ideal, this can work well. And if we're going to, certainly we, we can do, I mean, the, the metaphor fails in that you're not really supposed to ever use your equipment above your working load limit. It's a hard stop. But the point remains that there's a lot of usability above that, that you just have to make a case for it. And that happens with a constantly rotating matrix of all of the things that Gabe is talking about. If your primary problem if you are on a trail where, you know, like in the interior, we get a lot less rain. It's a lot more of our moisture happens <clears throat> within a snowpack um, and the evaporation might be different, whatever. Waters at many points isn't our biggest enemy or like when Gabe was building in Argentina, the bigger, way bigger enemy was wind. And so... In that case, it might be foolish to repress your grades in order to address water as the enemy when your way bigger problem was wind or brush or wildlife interactions or whatever they might be. So I, I always really try to, when we do a more advanced design and layout class, is to, like, it's not, you're not doing this when you're trying to decide. You're doing this. Like, it's a constant juggling, pivoting. Now, what about this? Now, and that's why the sustainability elements that we didn't go over at the very beginning of this talk, uh, this um, meeting, but Gabe started to talk about why we use that. We default to that so often because that's basically the language for the matrix of the nine or 10 things we always need to be considering. So then we say, I think it can be steeper here. I have a hunch based on ABC. All right. Well, that addresses contour, curvilinear alignment durable tread and integrated water control but it doesn't address the aesthetics the user previous user type and the um you know what whatever else i'm not thinking of off the top of my head but but each problem could be different that way so to me the take home is never that eight to ten is perfect it's that eight to ten is the target that covers 80 percent of trails will succeed at that level 10% of them might not even at that level and 10% can, can go way above that. I just made that up off the spot. And it's probably more like, you know, 60% could, could be perfect in that sweet spot. 20% could be higher. 10% shouldn't, you know what I mean? Getting at, um, it's meant to kind of be a starting point so that we, because imagine if we had taught sustainability trainings with 15 as the starting point, we would have trails all over that were pushing 40. If, if what we're starting with is more like eight and we're ending up with 25, I think that's more what it's intended to do. And, and maybe in that sense, it's it's like a speed limit on a highway. You know, it's like if you if you say that the speed limit's 55, the, the you're acknowledging that most people will go 60, uh, a percentage will go 65 and another percentage will go 70 and then the outliers will go 80. But but if you start at, well, most people are going to go 60 anyway, then you just crept up all of those yeah, the other statistics. <laughs> I mean, so, so I think that's kind of the, from a big picture standpoint, it's just that the likelihood of succeeding at those lower grades is higher in, you know, a lot of situations, but I don't think that it's always the most appropriate. And I think the human factor, what kind of experience you're trying to create, what people will tolerate, you know, like, like you were mentioning before, we were talking about before is getting the buy-in and getting the trust of the user. And so in some cases, um, you know, a, a trail that's steeper will get more trust because it's people, the goal for people is to, I want to get out of the trees, out of the brush and get into the Alpine. And if I don't have a sense that that's happening soon, I'm either not going to use this trail or I'm going to make my own way that feels more direct. And that, that was something that really came 
into play quite a bit um, on the uh, in Patagonia in the job that we worked on down there is that you know there had been a couple options laid out in a bunch of different sections in Frida Moreno National Park that that were laid out at an eight percent you know super controlled grade you know it might have been a six mile section of trail and the the local crews and the local users who came from more of a mountaineering background were saying you know this in this region with the mountaineering history here um, people are used to climbers trails it's almost exclusively bedrock like we were hunting to keep to find areas where you could actually construct full bench on soil that wasn't so exposed to the wind that the soil would be removed and so we started we shifted while i was there we shifted into thinking about okay if we have bedrock if we have durable tread we can dramatically increase the grades um but i think it's risky to blanket template any of those issues to say no i don't think it should be eight to ten percent all the time i think it should be 12 percent or 14 percent or 18 percent all the time it, it needs to be contextual and suited to that spot that aspect that soil type that user group you know all of those things and i think we're gonna find Find that hopefully a lot of real world um, detail because we'll, we'll be able to put the mace in places where okay I thought we could get away with steeper here this is what we why we did so and it's not working which of these nine reasons is a factor here or maybe we'll come up with a couple that are site specific that's always a possibility too but I, I think yeah yeah it's complicated but I, I think those are some of the baseline thoughts. Yeah, and I will, I'll throw in there just dealing with some of, like even in the management end, like dealing with TMOs and stuff like that for trails, it, that's where managers can come in and look what kind of experience they want to give the, the visitors to a park, for example. So like when I, when talking about this and, and bringing in like the Alpine Ridge, you know, breaking down right now, the TMO shows Alpine Ridge is one trail is set at one TMO. Maybe it's breaking taking redoing the TMO and breaking that down in segments mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, if you have people that might just want to go up a little ways and get a view, you have it set at a certain classification. And then beyond that, it's a different classification. And that's a management tool that can be used um, and dialing it in. So, you know, that people get the experience that they want and dealing also with the terrain that you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's important a, too. Sorry, the, the that you know, I guess is kind of an iterative process. It's easy to think of the trail design management level trail design, the TMO or something happens first. This is what we want. This is our intention. But ideally, it would work in a bit more concert with the designing that you're doing now. Is to say, well, you know, this is what's possible. If we want that kind of experience, it might be hugely costly to have an eight to 10% trail to this certain point. But if we modify the TMO to reflect what we're finding on the ground and with the, with the recognition, like you're saying, Eric, it's like, we want some visitors to have a certain kind of experience. Can we provide that on a lower down spot where they get to a Vista? So we have um, the more, the lower graded trail to a point and then you know, based on kind of the way the terrain's changing or the users would change, then we then we change it. And yeah. I think the pacing or the timing of that makes a lot of sense too. You know, we talk about that that principle of trail development as telescoping, basically either in or out. Usually, in you know, you're you're starting wide, you're reaching a a point where you narrow the the use, uh, in, or the amount of use, and also the amount of kind of the trail class perfection <laughs> and then you keep going outward and a lot of times what really helps is to right at the pinch point where you're telescoping down is to to use one of these principles in the way that will be different in this section so you you might choose to put in a steeper section very early in the transition so we get the user agreement they suddenly realize okay that was a junction section and now this is what i'm in for 
Now there's a section where the roots are more exposed. Now there's a section where there's rock where I need to use my hands, whatever. Choosing in your overall target grade, um, average target grade, you might choose to push your grades actually earlier in some sections to set your user up for the fact that that's happening now um, and create the social contract with the user as opposed to you know, have them hike tons more way and then get to a middle section where everything's super steep and kind of almost like um, like a bait and switch kind of. And that doesn't always mm -hmm. happen. It's always terrain driven first and foremost. But I do like to think about it as that as well. Hig, since you were saying it's a combination of the landscape and user, how can when we do change something up, how do we consider the user's experience as uh, one of the nine elements that we're thinking about? I mean, the, the, an example of that, and it's, it hasn't been used, the Curry to Kasugi connector trail and the Curry Ridge trail in general hasn't been used probably enough, um, to, uh, be, to really have ground truth this thoroughly, but we tried, you know, the first couple miles was built with a machine. We built it wide. It's, you know, four feet wide Then it telescopes down to uh, hand built narrower as it's getting in entering the alpine and then at the, a very specific section actually that yeah. we chose for like a massive immovable boulder and then moving into for a uh, different forest type so that the user doesn't realize it but they're getting yeah the, an aesthetic and a structural telescope at the same time it's and so the terrain's changing there and then it happens again um as we're as the trail approaches the brush line so that at, that other transition was pretty close to tree line and then as we transition from brush line to essentially like true alpine, uh, the classification changes again, uh, the directness and bedrock fins, you know, are very prevalent up there. So the directness changes. And then there are some places where you're just kind of stepping up onto bedrock direct ascent. Like shoots and ladders style. Yeah. And, and the, the idea design wise was that that became appropriate. The user's the broad swath of users has been winnowed down to more uh sturdy hikers long people who can handle more miles who can handle a lower classification trail and higher challenge and all that and it starts to be feel more like it's a mountain it's a you're it's a route a, it's a route to, you're approaching yeah. you know the top of a ridge and so you don't need um to traverse anymore you can go straight for it and then there's you know cairns marking the route in, in places like that you know so yeah i think that ideally you you have a terrain driven change in your design parameters um and that might not be exactly what you're talking about hey maybe you're talking about just over an overall blanket uh, adjustment to what the kind of maximum sustainable grade is but i do think that that the soil type and the use and all of those other things ideally are factoring into that Maybe, maybe that's a good good reason to jump up here. So I've, I've kind of gone back and forth. So, okay, first of all, I want to just show this, show the imagery here. So we're up in the tundra at this point. And uh, so this was one site where I'd, you know, I put two options in. One has three corners and one just has a single fairly sharp and steep corner that's out, you know, near the bluff and, uh, and, and uh, kind of sharp. And um, and I have concerns about both of these options. Um, if we go back to where we can see the topography, you can get a sense of what the user might be experiencing. But for instance, if he did this triple corner option, like running down this ridge looks kind of attractive. It's a fair ways. Let's see how far it's, uh, you know, 150 feet. So it's not like the trails right next to you, but it, you know, that would seem really tempting and stuff. Um, uh, you know, in some ways I like this, you know, you go and actually take it, there's a little bit of brush out here. Um, so you actually cut, you know, you cut all the brush above the trail here. I, I kind of like when I'm building trail in the tundra to go through the one bush and like kill it completely. And it's like my little fight against the brush taking over the tundra. But, um, but this, I'd probably leave the brush on the inside of the corner, you know, and it would provide this view. It's kind of hard to tell with, with this, but you know, it's precipitous over here. So you would you would want to like, uh, actually one of the things I've seen, you have to be really careful when you're near cliffs is that people with vertigo will take and braid away from the cliff, 
you know, so so you have to really think that's a place where user agreement becomes an issue. You need to think about not only user safety, but also kind of finding this common ground where all the hikers are willing to hike in one spot rather than having some people who are eager to walk right along the edge and other people who want to be 10 feet back from it. So there are a whole bunch of, you know, considerations to make there. And one of them simply being that this is pretty steep. You know, you probably would be putting some little steps or something in there. But in this one, it seems quite difficult to get around, you know, the potential for people to shortcut, which to me, that seems like a bigger problem. Uh, you know, I'm like, game to go out and try to find out how to make some some stairs you know this i don't see a way around someone trying to cut here and um so anyway it's a tough spot uh maybe i'll I'll stop there and let you guys react we do this all the time two layouts turns exactly like that and we very very rarely even though the climbing turn grades are preferable and easier and require less structures we very rarely commit to an open tundra sweep turn with no either break in slope or visual obstacles just because of exactly what you're saying and I just based on this scenario this would be a place where I would probably push grade in concert with I mean two things occur to me if you were going to take the white off the map because of that and because of what we I just said and move to the to the yellow line I'd have to know that the ground could handle it there we can't just be like we'll make this we'll do the steep one because this one won't work as well if the ground is too steep to accept or there's water percolating through it say because it's it has some sort of toe of slope effect which can happen a lot where ground is really steep but it's really wet all around wherever the bedrock is protruding something like that then that might become a control point where we shouldn't have a turn because there isn't a place to steepen it enough and there isn't a place to hide it so then that might be a larger layout decision. So I guess what I'm getting at is just because one of our two options doesn't work doesn't mean we go for steep no matter what. It just means here's a place where steep would be worth it if we can get permission from the ground to do so. Yeah, and I think that, that people don't. Um, there's le it's the aspect of sustainability um, encompassed by people staying on the trail is one that is not that it's important and and it's harder to quantify you know you can you can lay something out and say um you know this this looks good on paper this is the right grades this is this is the right terrain it's the right soil type it's the right aspect but if people will shortcut it or won't stay on that section because of a lack of trust built up until that point or because of just the human kind of factor of I can see where I'm going to be in a few minutes and I'm just going to go straight there on my way back down. Um, you know, the whole that the Blaine Smith's favorite favorite thing to say is, yeah, I came out here for a nice hike. I want to get it over with as soon as possible. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, just the idea that but I mean, it's so operative. And I think so that I think you're I, I think what you're the, the, the compare and contrast analysis and is is the right way to think about it is this looks good but the white line looks might look good but if people won't use it or won't stay on it or they'll use it going up but they won't use it going down um is there an option that is going to be a better solution even if it's you know quote unquote breaking some of the rules um or need kind of sustainability mitigation in in the steeper sections another thing that occurs to me is that um you know the how eric mentioned management level decisions earlier is that um another part of management is communication and so if if you come i mean we certainly have had trails where we've come to places where there it's just tundra everywhere and you got to make a, a gain you don't have a choice to hide it somewhere you just it's out in the open um but the more um education that the agency or the guide or whoever's using it or just the general culture of the trail you know say i'm just using tutka as an example i know there's a facebook page for it and i think of um luke mel his his tagline is creating a culture of safety around pack rafting in particular but just general outdoor adventuring and i think about that with trails like how can we quote create a culture of sustainability that's beyond just the construction part 
so that anybody who visits the Tucker Bay Facebook page or gets the update on, you know, how to do this or that, like part of that is an education about fragile alpine tundra, about significant um, time was taken to mitigate resource damage that, you know, you're stepping onto lands that have been used for ten tens of thousands of years, whatever. We can do those types of educational and culture of sustainability parts after the fact to help pick up the slack for places where we might not have the ideal on the ground. And I don't mean to say that everybody's going to, that that might, 5% of people might still cut switchbacks, but in the same way that the Leave No Trace program made a huge difference in the cleanliness of backcountry sites, even though not everybody does it. Um, I think similarly, just cutting down on the knowing, hey, there are places you might want to do your own thing and here's why you shouldn't or Here's what your actions will, how will affect this place or whatever. I think there can be quite a bit of room, especially in a new trail that's developing a new culture around it. Now, um, getting the word out about those elements could be much more doable than trying to create, trying to switch a user um, default after it's already pretty entrenched. I would, I would agree with that, actually. And the thing is, is that it, it, with educating the, the people that are going to go out and use trails, and especially in Alpine areas, where in the past, I think um, it has been more of an open, uh, you know, you get to Alpine, you, you spread out. But the thing is that changing with more use, that becomes more entrenched and you have braided trails. If you can educate people how to, like if there is a, tread to stick with the tread and try to also then lay it out in hiding corners and so you don't have that you know oh i see this down here um and it's a long game you know it's just like chris christine was saying it's just like it's maybe not so much switching the people our age so much than getting people that in the next generation this is what is happening you know this is how you go about it you know, we don't do it this way anymore. We do it this way. And it's just about change. And the and older we, we all get, it's harder we harder we have with change sometimes. And we've really seen the the down and the upsides, like how that works and doesn't in the Denali backcountry, because when we moved to Denali, Denali was a quote trailless park outside of the front country areas. And a lot of pride was put into when you were new up here nobody just said oh just do this trip we love this you know anderson pass loop where you start and can't well and you come out here like nobody did that it, you had to sit down with a map and you had to tell somebody here's what i'm thinking about and, and a mentor or an older person or someone who'd been around longer might say oh you might look twice at that crossing point or whatever but it was very much possible to as you said eric spread out once you got to tree line because people were all making their own way Denali didn't perfectly anticipate, as most of us didn't, how social media was going to change the metric of how people use landscapes. And now Denali is not a trailless park. Almost all of the overland connect ups are downloadable on all trails or you can get, uh, you know, somebody's Instagram tag of exactly where they were. And people are replicating to the step trails that used to be everybody would find their own way. And so I think Tutka we're at the early stage it the good thing is it's growing up in an already a culture of you know social media default where there's a, a way to to both draw users in and also communicate with them um i see there being a lot of potential in getting ahead of the curve um with education on the sustainability aspects both why certain choices were made what you might find and see little ways to just increase the general collective intelligence around trail design. And also if you're doing this and you want to take all the effort and come out here on this new thing, here's what you're signing up for. Do this, do this, do this, do this. These are basically like the ethics of the Tutka backdoor um, thing. And then you'll have more chance to nip the resource degradation in the bud. Well, and, and maybe it's similar to the way like national parks, I don't know if uh, there are commercial use permits that the st state park does in Kajmak Bay State Park. But, you know, if you want to guide in, in public on public land, you need to have a permit for that. And there may be stipulations about, um, you know, what kind of education you have to provide to your clients and 
and the you know that there's kind of a requirement for um informing people about these choices and the consequences of leaving the trail alignment or whatever in these places where you're if you are anticipating like on this trail that um especially if you put in um a, a better alignment that it would become a really popular destination um that might be another aspect of you know sustainability enhancement is just that's a requirement for people using the trail or getting commercial use permits to guide people on the trail or whatever else or at the very least even if it's not enforceable it's creating a culture of of sustainable use so that if you are defaulting from that you're more of an outlier there's a bit more of a public taboo or sense of that's not how we do it here uh, you know, most people who are seeking out a remote experience like these, where it takes some effort to get there, they're not your typical, like, we're going to snow machine out there and leave all our cigarette butts anyway. But a, a lot of things, at times I think people just don't know, like well-intentioned hikers just don't think about how their tiny decision Im is impacted when it's, when it is exponentially um, chosen by everybody else who uses it as well. So anyway, I know this is a bit off topic, but I just started thinking oh. about when we have non-ideal situations like that, what are the other tools we have at our disposal? And I think something about how how n relatively new this this terrain and area feels to burgeoning use, um, it's a good time to be thinking about it. Uh, one one way I've been thinking about it recently is like you know your list you said nine or ten you know sustainable trail elements and like. You know, cranking it up to eleven. Uh, um, uh, I I like the idea that your trail use community should be involved actively in the maintenance, potentially improvement, and best case, actually building the trail. Um, and uh, as a sustainability element, like that, that is that is a way of connecting the. Um, the sort of thought process that goes into design choices that are made to the user community. And of course, like not every user is part of the, you know, uh, of the trail crew. But if you, I, I think this is something that I've, I've really striven for is to try to include a diversity of users in not just, you know, in, in as many different aspects of, uh, you know, of, of the trail, um, as possible, and and this gets meta because I, I see that as one of the uh, one of the benefits of this conversation here. And we have have people like Stan and Kathy who have been you know huge uh, you know out in the field doing doing work on trails. Um, and I think that it's really critical that communities of users be actually actively involved in these conversations. Um, so yeah, anyway. I very much agree. <laughs> um, all right, I want to show one more thing, but I know we're we're, we're getting getting on here uh, beyond you know towards our our real maximum time rather than the than the uh, supposed not maximum time. But I, I alluded to <laughs> our working load limit was exceeded, right? <laughs> right, right, right. I, I uh, so I'll I'll just bring up this I'm last still, thing. Uh, I'm still here. <laughs> Good job, Kathy. We're breaking your record, right? <laughs> um, but uh, this is this is some of these potential uh, first viewpoints. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, you know, just the early part of the conversation, I was like, "Yeah, you kind of do want more flatness about like you want to have this feeling of like I'm going to stop and rest here, not like I'm clinging to this alder while I look out <laughs> over this cliff. Um, and I feel like if these are not optimal in that sense, they're not super steep. Like you can take a look here. These are, I mean, let's see. So if I just measure the distance there, so looking at the train, this is like a 30, well, a little, little steeper than 30% grade uh, for the train, which is, you know, you can sit on that. Uh, that's that's that's. Uh, but still, it's definitely not flat. Um, yeah, it makes me wonder. I mean, you can't quite get to this one. There's a flat spot here, so maybe maybe this would be a spot that we could somehow work in. You know, uh, a corner in. You know, I could imagine. I don't know. I have to figure out the other parts, but like, um, imagine a corner coming through here. But in my ideal world. Um, 
yeah, maybe, okay, just to explain a little bit of how I'm thinking here. So this area is uh, in the alder. Um, and uh, there's these are probably a little bit of Calmograstus grass. Uh, so there is little like deep grass meadows, um, but largely alder. And so some of what I was picturing here is having a corner um, and then actually actively mowing an area to help open up that view and make that, you know, kind of a part of the maintenance. And I, I, I've been advocating for thinking about the first few years of maintenance isn't really maintenance. It's part of building the trail. It's the part where you like train the vegetation to behave uh, politely along the side of the trail and that sort of thing. But so that early, that early effort of trail clearing would involve also establishing vegetation that would support being able to see out and this is the view I was showing earlier, you know, it's this view looking up the lake. Anyway, kind of struggling with this a bit. Curious, curious what your takes are on that. Uh, it seems like a lot of, um, you're putting a lot of eggs in the basket of you'll have the maintenance capacity, which I think it's just risky. I think it's, um, you know, it, in an ideal world, you would have that as far as training the vegetation. I don't know. I mean, I think that's a. Um... You haven't had a lot of luck with that. <laughs> well, I, this is where I, I want to stop calling that maintenance. That's not maintenance. Like if you're going to yeah. build the trail, you got to train the vegetation. Like if you didn't do that, you didn't build the trail. And so, of course, it overgrows and you don't have a trail. Like, I think that that's that's a. I think it's a framing that that's not only for us in this group who are, you know, actually involved in the physical trail, but as far as funders and, you know, people that are much, you know, at a different part of this whole system, if we stop calling that maintenance, that would be good because it's not yeah. maintenance. You don't have a trail if you don't go and put the work in in the early years to make sure it's not going to just overgrow. Yeah. I mean, I think that but we, we bumped up against some of that, um, on the the first section of the Curry Ridge Trail, when um, we were going through you know steep sections of of really dense alder, and we ended up clearing, um, I mean basically twice as wide on our own dime. I mean we, we cleared sometimes 16, 20 feet mm -hmm. swaths of alder, and the trail specifications on our construction contract were like eight, right. you know a eight foot wide corridor and and but when you actually are there cutting the alder you realize if i just follow the exact specifications that are just somewhat generic in for this trail classification this thing is going to be grown in in two summers well and with a certain steepness of side slope like you might have the right corridor and you have alder hitting your excavator cab while you're building it because it's just not enough room because of the terrain or what it's saying is. So I think you're getting at something similar. Hey, it might it might require overbuilding the spec initially in order to get functionally what you want out of it two or three years later. I mean, the hard part about that is the hard part about lumping that in as construction is it makes the funding of things or the taking on of jobs or the phasing of projects very difficult because you don't if you call that construction, you don't get closure, either funding or permitting or invoicing or whatever until something's finished. I can almost see calling it like a, you know, a, a separate thing, like distinguishing it from just cyclical maintenance, but having it be a separate contract. For for example, in a situation like ours, we might do a build of something and then a different type of, of um, contractor could provide the first two years of could almost be called like i don't know i can't brainstorm it off the top of my head but something you know like initial initial maintenance period or something because a lot of times like to be honest i i don't we don't have the time in our schedules to spend two more seasons brushing so that something's perfect you know what i mean especially because we be... wouldn't get paid until the job's done so if but the if construction that... isn't <laughs> yeah. over for two more seasons right. you know then we're gonna <laughs> but if that could be outsourced as a task that a brushing contractor could do that might be a really good way to start thinking about that as kind of an intermediate phase of a new new trail development yeah, and I, I know from the fact that with maintenance that we've done on our trails here, 
and when we were building back in the 90s and going through alders it was going wide and that if we weren't at the, and this is all before tmo stuff yeah. and all this and we did with management but it's just like you know after once you do as we all have worked in alders you realize that if you're coming through here to add a little bit more time while you're running saws to take stuff back then you're not coming back for a while and then maybe as things grow it will easier maintenance that could be done with just loppers and not hand tools as things start encroaching you know or not power tools but using hand tools as things start encroaching can make it a, a quicker and easier to help with that you know like training of the vegetation so to speak you know that it doesn't necessarily grow in and it starts growing up like with alders instead of growing out yeah and in some cases maybe what comes back in is ferns and devil's club or you know some something no. but still that's a um it's a lot easier to harness a a, a, a crew to clear you know to brush ferns or knock down annual veg than to cut stubborn old growth alder where half the time when that's a problem where your your side slope is impinging on your corridor because of the sweep of growing brush you have to actually cut slots to even get rid of your brush i mean we had that on the curry yeah. project we couldn't even if you threw it off the trail it would it. just be hanging in the brush of 20 <laughs> feet below which is a pretty not very aesthetic uh, outcome for a <laughs> um but hey to get back to something you mentioned earlier where um kind of brushing out a flat spot uh we actually, another type of terrain-based control point that we look for often is um, sloping ground directly adjacent to a flat flattening so that we can site turns where we're not, basically if it's a switchback, you're not having to build the, the turning table. And if it's a um, if it's a um, sweep turn, you, basically your point of deepest entrenchment is starting to flatten. So anywhere where we can picture kind of a triangle with a flat spot to the side where you're you're having enough grade entering and exiting to have shedding, but a flatness in the middle of the turn, that's almost always an asset. And that could be a place where, like you're saying, you could, um, you could brush it wide to start. Um, and because it's a turn, it won't look as artificial as like you just made a UFO landing spot in the middle of the brush uh, because you're already having a direction reversing sense there. It kind of buys a little bit of um, room to alter without it being drawing a lot of attention to itself. Um, those are places we always I think it. this is that kind of turn. Like, yeah. so we've got this sort of benchy area here. It's a little steep. These are neither, this one's significantly steep. This one's not all that steep, but they're steeper than this area, which is fairly flat. And so I, then I have the corner coming along here. There's a gully that comes down here. So you've got a spot to shed water to um, that will separate from the trail. So I think, is that, am I am I understanding when you, uh, you call it a sweep term, turn, I think? Um, yeah, we, climbing, we turn. climbing turn or a sweep Just turn. A climbing. It, it, climbing turn is kind of the the most widely known use for it. I think that's what Emba calls it. Mike Shields started calling it a sweep turn because he likes to, I think he's right about this. He calls things turns, not corners, because turns have a sense of flow to them and corners have a very geometric feel that we typically associate more with building structures. So I think just what you get from the use of sweep, the use of turn, mm -hmm. um, the use of slope when you're naming things just gives you the feeling that this is a contouring um, thing as opposed to a collection of vectors. Um, mm -hmm. Those are, I think that's why we default sometimes to saying those. But yeah, sweep and a climbing turn are the same thing. Also, the sweep gives you the feeling that it's also a descending turn, depending on or which degree you're going, <laughs> which di direction you're coming from. And that there's some momentum mm -hmm. involved. Yeah. And it in includes the sense of a radius. So. It will be interesting to go out and see this area in person, and this I won't be able to look at soon because it'll be still well under snow, but I I feel like there probably is somewhere in here where we could get a really, you know, kind of a destination kind of feeling. Um, it might take some, you know, some of the things I do with gardening. I think Stan has been in the position where he, I, he had a Travis tool and was asked to go out and kill every salmonberry that is within reach of the trail um, <laughs> while leaving the ferns carefully in between them. Uh, um, we do, we do, we take the, the trail gardening quite seriously. Um, and uh, we've even like sometimes planted spruce trees like six feet, eight feet off the trail. Um, they won't be beneficial in the short term, but then 
in 15 years, then you start getting that shadowing that can uh, suppress brush. I haven't been at it for 15 years, so I can't tell you whether that works or not, but we, we at least, you know, aspire to that. Um, and yeah, uh, we've done that you know, with uh, plugging, plugging a tree into an open um, uh, and a turn without any um, between the legs. Yeah. Between the legs yeah. of, a, of an open turn too. Yeah. Same thing. Who knows if, if it's going to work, but you're cutting it down anyway, you might as well make it useful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we do also like collecting sod and, you know, dump every, you know, dump all the material. Like sometimes I've actually done this on the outside of a trail just for a very short, you know, so it's not like continuous berm, which would be a problem, but instead a single lump on the, on the downslope of a trail. And so dump material there and then take all the sod and resod the surface. So you have this bump and you have this little sense of like kind of a gateway feeling like the way Mark, Mark talks about it sometimes. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway. Well, I, 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 we are, we are coming up very close to three hours. So I want to just, uh, leave it open for, uh, last comments, uh, thoughts, questions. Yeah, I feel like we've talked a lot, which I know was the point, but um, I'd be happy to hear if anybody else has anything that came up, anyone who's been quiet, anybody who has a last thought. What's the next step for, for um, dividing this into sections and making it shovel ready if we start, you know, want to do grants in the future, starting up with the Tundra? So my thought, and 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 uh, invite uh, reactions to this, but is that uh, after this conversation, I'm going to do another pass on the whole route and kind of take some of what I've learned today and use it to inspire some changes. Um, and then maybe both Eric and I will get to look at some of the lower portions fairly soon. And I'll try to coordinate with Eric maybe to figure out some ways that he can, uh, you know, use use some of the data I have most effectively. Um, uh, and as I see it, or what I hope is that by the end of the summer, we have a lot more of the ground truth aspect of this. Um, I don't know when I would specifically be going into the upper part, but I'd like to do that at some point. It sounds like Eric might get up there. Um, uh, and then uh, we would be looking at actually developing a proposal over next winter and figuring out the um, the specifics of funding and sequencing uh, over the course of the next winter. I mean, the only the uh, and the one thing one thing that I would just kind of revisit in terms of um, the next step is just make sh make sure that you answer some of the big picture questions about who are the users, what is the goal of from a park perspective of what kind of user experience do we want on the trail are there are there points control points where you can designate a telescoping of trail class or user group or any of those things so that your trail design is reflecting um those those different the different needs and different standards um whether they're terrain based or user based or um you know, whatever else that that might be something to get out in front of, whether it's through conversation with Eric or, or, um, you know, community input or whatever else. But I think, um, that's so it's, uh, you know, we often are in this position where we're like, Oh, can you, can you design me a trail? It's like saying, can you design me a house? It's like, well, how many rooms, how, 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 you know what 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 facilities what services do you want a washer and dryer do you want two bedrooms like so it seems so el elementary that it's almost goes without saying but i think it's helpful to come back to before you can design something you kind of need to know who am i designing for what are my you know what are my parameters and so that might help you make even hone in a little tighter on some of all this good work that you've done with drawing it in and the level of detail that you have with these contour lines and the other imagery it, it really can you can get so close to in a lot of cases what you want the trail to be when you go out there but if you haven't answered those questions ahead of time 
you might be drawing a line that doesn't meet the needs that you're trying to meet. And so, you know. Hey, do we ever send you a copy of the trail design worksheet that we use? It, it's kind of a pre-TMO. Mike Shields authored it and we've done some tweaks to it. I can send you it after. I can send it after this, but yeah, it's, I mean, the TMO, it, ca it captures it captures more than a TMO single sheet usually does. And it allows you to think through some stuff that might end up on a TMO visually eventually, but not be locked into whatever the agency type is that you're using. We kind of use it as like a prequel. So I'll send that over to you. And that might be just kind of help guide your putting it to paper a little bit. Yeah. And I would uh, even throw out there too, of dealing with, um, this work on Alpine Ridge is is throwing out and maybe having some public meetings, you know, to see what the input of the the public and maybe what they want, so we can uh, for a park and on the management side, what what are people looking for? Would they want to see, you know, we know people want to get up to Alpine. I I, I get that, but do do they want? Do we want to have an, a a place a destination down lower on alpine ridge you know at a certain different class than versus going up or do we want it all at something you know and this is maybe something to throw out in dealing with some um, public meetings or a public survey or something that kind of what camille did uh a little bit with um uh cottonwood eastland and all that and getting some public input you know what they might want or not want great point yeah yeah because i kind of visualized um like north grace has a a viewpoint where it's accessible to even people that are slightly out of shape and can rally and can get to there but then beyond that you know we all know grace ridge gets more uh, technical and hardcore, but when I've guided people, we always try to make the viewpoint on Grace Ridge, and they still get the benefit of being up there, but they don't have to do the whole the whole thing. But it'd be nice to have something like that on Alpine, where it's a viewpoint that most people can make, and then you know, letting them know it's more technical beyond this or something. Yeah. And then I could also see in dealing as things going forward is breaking it down into sections and working in these small sections. Um, we, you know, we just want to make sure as things go forward, be it if it's not necessarily on parks radar right at this point to really deal with Alpine Ridge. So we are, we are open to other people getting involved with the construction or, and, and all that. Um, there, I will say that there will probably be, um, we are trying to go in the direction of having more oversight, which we haven't had in the past, just because of our workload and lack of staffing, um, that is being changed, not with more staffing, with just a redirection of where staffing should concentrate their efforts on. So that is something also to keep into consideration and just in coming up with a um a logical timeline and that there will be you know just trying not to have too much frustration and, and trying to keep the communication channels open and clear of where what parks would like to see and they're having a little bit more involvement and oversight of all that so yeah on the on the sequencing thing one thing that's a kind of a <clears throat> nice about this trail is, you know, there is an existing trail. And so at some level, every place that it crosses, that's a segment, you know, so for instance, this one here, I kind of like it in some ways, maybe there's a viewpoint here, et cetera, et cetera. However, you could leave this to the end of the whole process because the trail exists. Uh, it's, you know, maybe has some issues going over this knob, but it's not gonna be that big a deal to leave it until later. One of the challenges I think is that you know, even without the blueberry loop part, this whole northern part, you know, the um, so the way I have it mapped here, I'm actually just leaving it on the existing alignment here. But there is a fairly, you know, I don't know, that's not too big a section. But anyway, this section going up here, it the first kind of the first chunk that you might bite into is is fairly significant. And then if you want to protect the tundra 
up here, you know, if you if we do end up electing to do this, this is a quite a large section, lots of alder, you know, this whole thing would be, you know, once you bite bite into that, that's, you know, whatever, three quarters of a mile or something of trail. Um, uh, so, you know, so we, we have to, we'll just, I think that actually drawing some kind of a sequencing chart would be a useful addition to the, you know, kind of future discussions. I would agree. I think that's a great idea, actually. And to keep it open that it's not fixed in stone, that it's going to be a fluid you know, yeah. a fluid document, you know, and all that. Um, because as we all know, you run into stuff that you don't anticipate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I I picture in the long range, you know, the friends really spearheading this with the parks approval later, you know, with RTP grants as we, you know, I'm always dreaming. So anyway. <laughs> I, I think this would make a really good case for an RTP. I think that the, uh, you know, the, the amount, like because it is a place that already has a lot of access, you know, a lot of, a lot of activity and that the problems are, you know, with the trail that we'd be looking at addressing are just totally clear that solving those problems will uh, really add a lot of value for the public, I, I would say I, I think I think we could make quite a compelling RTP proposal, um, and if we leverage that, you know, with quite a bit of community, uh, you know, crew out there um, actually getting into some of the work, so that you know we have professionals involved, but we also get a lot of work done with with local community members that are volunteering. Then I think um, I think it'd be pretty amazing how quickly this could go uh, with good design up front. Yeah, and then just another thing from a from the parks view too is, as as everybody knows, um, dealing with our with our lack of any kind of staffing to really do any kind of maintenance, for that matter, is that as even with Alpine Ridge and its proximity, and as things get better with that trail, we get more use is that, you know, somebody's going to have to pick up or an entity is going to have to pick up that maintenance component. I don't see the state at this point, you know, or us as in Ketchumac Bay State Park, you know, getting any more funding for any kind of maintenance, you know, and I think, I think everybody <clears throat> understands that, but it's just something that needs to be said also up front. Um, yeah. So, so everybody understands what we're where we're headed and what is going to be hoped that will follow through after the construction in different parts of this construction of this happens. Yeah, and friends would be taking that on. Yeah, that could be. We've been talking about that with Cotland East, Cottonwood Eastland as well as building and kind of an MOA into yes. development so that we're we have a path forward that someone is accountable whether by by hours or by funding um for the upkeep of that so it, it becomes not just kind of a de facto state park problem um and i think you know having the having the uh motivation for this imp these improvements come out of a user generated pool of interest and passion is a great precursor because that shows that people are you know, invested, and that makes it a lot easier than something that gets built from a different mode and then asks somebody else to, to clean it up or keep it going. So, yeah, kudos to all of you guys for all the organizing and you know, partnership. Doing, partnership Thank building. you. Thanks. Yeah, it's really it's impressive. You guys have a, such a motivated, motivated group, <laughs> motivated community, and it's like even just this design level stuff is is uh takes a lot of time so it's i mean i think that um one of the things that we've been talking about that christine was mentioning about with cotton for cottonwood eastland and in conversation with Camille is is there a way to quantify in a dollar figure what annual maintenance would cost so that that can be built into either an mou with a nonprofit or a community group or it would be almost coming up with something, what we've been talking about with her is, is there a way to get um, a community group 
not on the hook isn't the right term, but kind of right. um, obligated to say if we um, if we don't generate the um, volunteer hours, you know, within the organization, then we're committed to raising funds to pay to have the maintenance done through a contract or some other way. And I don't know exactly what that that we we even mean by that or what what that would really look like, but um, we don't have great numbers um, on maintenance costs because anymore we rarely are doing maintenance professionally um and when we did it was with the federal government and so there's just not really any <laughs> budget tracking <laughs> kinds of things but but um if between eric and you know carter and hig and kathy and camille and anybody who wants to try to chase down estimates for what we think in terms of hours it would require to maintain some of these things then if you assign a dollar figure to that if you had to contract it out i think that will go a long way to um kind of easing the reluctance of you know that i think eric's eric's expressing is that if the parks doesn't have anybody to that they can have do the maintenance and if people are like yeah we promise we'll maintain it but there's not really a um kind of the buck stops here and, and, if it's a, and if it's a fixed number, it's a plan. It's a planable expense. It's yeah. not like saying, you know, oh yeah, this is probably going to cost something. It's like it might be cyclical for the nonprofit, just like it is for an agency where you find funding every year for, you know, up to twelve thousand dollars worth of maintenance match or hours or whatever. I just made that number up out of my yeah. clear blue sky, so don't take that as anything yeah. real. You know what I mean? Yeah. And everybody knows. Oh, yeah. Where are we going to find that fifteen grand this year? Or where are we going to find that whatever? As yeah. opposed to having it be reinitiated every time um, something is at a crisis point. I, I yeah. I've been trying to do the initial. Like I think that you, you mentioned there isn't the data to back it up right now. And and I kind of as I see it, I, so I've written some code to try to like it. You know, takes whatever set of assumptions you want to make and spits out a total amount of time. I didn't. Yeah. Time, but you could convert that to dollars. Uh, for maintenance and for building and for maintenance and those assumptions that I that I'm putting in as a first take are undoubtedly totally wrong but as I see it we can use that as a framework and you know we could have a similar discussion to this about like well how much more time does it take to maintain x sort of trail versus y sort of trail and um and you know we could we could come to some sort of agreement on that and then we could test it against reality and see if in a couple of years are we like oh actually we thought this part would be no big deal but it's been this huge headache what are the factors that we didn't consider that led to that and so i don't think it's i, I don't at least to my knowledge the data doesn't exist to make a really uh certain estimate of that in in the short term but i think that starting to think in those terms might lead us in the right direction yeah i think i have some, that's great. Yeah, go ahead eric oh i was just gonna say i have some old data because we started collecting or i should say i started collecting data after going through this some of this stuff you know years ago and um so i have some old data about how many person hours it took for like logging out brushing and it's just from crews reporting, you know, writing this stuff down and then letting me know. And it's just trying to get it a, a, so it comes back to planning and asking for funding and stuff like that. And then the other thing with new trails too, um, is that as maintenance goes on, as the years from the completion, let's say of construction goes on, you know, the first few years, it could even be up to five years, depending upon the terrain you're going through, the maintenance could be very low, but as time goes on to the 10 year, 15 years out, your maintenance costs might increase a little bit more, you know, in a yearly basis. I mean, I've yes. see, kind of seen that with the saddle trail because we have been doing very little maintenance of the new section that we have built. There is some, but not hugely a lot. Yeah, some, some of the way I've been approaching that is that, that first year is you can get away with not much maintenance but that if instead you are maintaining your uprooting alder when they're this tall instead of yep. big trees and sam alder and salmon berries being the main ones that i i focus on in yep. those cases that that can that can then smooth it, it ends up smoothing that curve out a little bit and might benefit over the long term yeah i mean and maybe we're getting maybe the, um, oh sorry go ahead kev 
we're getting past noon here. I have to get going. So okay. it's, this is yeah, good we conversation. Have to, we have to transition also yep. to our next uh, thing. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Maybe we should, we could, we can kind of uh, um, cut it off there um, unless there's any like critical last comments. My critical last comment was kudos, glad to be invited to participate, but then we blew right by it. So I'm not going to try again. <laughs> no, I, yeah, you guys are doing a great, a great thing. And it's, uh, it's, it's an honor to be a part of it. Well, thank you. Thank you guys. I look forward to thank lots you. of time to discuss this summer. So right. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.